My check one, two, one, two.
Before his presence of his esteem with exceeding gladness. To the only wise, father God, our Savior, be esteemed in greatness and might and authority, both now and forever. Shalom, shalom, shalom. I greet you all in the name of our coming king. Uh, some call him Yeshua. Some call him Yeshaya. Some call him Yahusha. Some call him Yahweh Shai. Uh, most of the world know him as Jesus the Christ or Jesus Christ. I salute you and greet you all in the name of our coming king. He is our Lord and Savior, as they say in the church. He is our king and he's our reason for being. Um, I pray the Most High has shined upon you some way, somehow today. Uh, if you had a, a hellish day, a Barak Yah that you made it through it. Uh, this is our Tuesday night Bible study being rendered on Thursday night. We're going to offer up uh, our national prayer and then we get right into tonight's class. It's still a school night for many of us. So I don't want to be too long. So I'm going to do my best to utter our national prayer in the tongue of our um, uh, native, our native tongue, and then we'll utter it in the tongue of our captivity. Barakatha Yahawa Malak Ha'alam. Ashanatan Barakatha Yahawa Malak Ha'alam. Shalak, if me start over. Abanaba Shaba Shemayam Kadash Haya Shanka. Yahawa Malak Wathka, Thaba for Tazawanka. Haya Asha Ba Arataza Kaya Haya Ba Shemayam. The Dala Nawala Kam Ka Yawam. Wasalak Nawa, Kawa Waf Nawa, Kasalak, Kawa Waf Yinawa. Wala A, the Baya Anawa, Banasi Yawam. A bow, Hava Shai Nawa, Mara Kayala Ka. Ha Malak Wath, Waha Allah. Waha alam wayam. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread 
Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the power, the kingdom, the glory. May we assure you, how shall we pray? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, family, this is Brother Obadiah of the Torah Group, and this is our Tuesday night Bible study being brought to you on a Thursday night. And, and it's a special class. Uh, we're in uh, peak season uh, for, for the um, most of the nation in the world. It's their holiday season. But I want to take a, just a, a moment to salute each and every one of our family and friends who are celebrating uh, the Feast of Dedication. Many of our family and friends are starting the Feast of Dedication tonight. Uh, it's known as Hanukkah to most people. So to each and every one of our uh, assemblies out there that's lighting up the candles tonight in honor of our King and our Savior, we salute you, we barak of you, we say the Most High shine upon you and bless your feast for these next eight days. Or may Yah keep you all and keep your lights burning. Um, we have a, a, it's not going to be a long class. It's, it's a, it's a short class, but it's a much needed class. And we're continuing with our theme of, um, 25 days of idolatry. And what we're hoping to do family, we're hoping to, uh, share and teach our family and friends with love that this season that is upon, upon us and most of them are celebrating is really not a biblical uh, celebration. It's not found in the Bible. And actually, when you do the research, it's, it's idolatrous and, and it's something that we were punished for. So that's the goal of our class tonight. And we, we've been continuing the theme for the, since December came in and we dedicate our Shabbat services on Saturdays to bring out the, the more of this truth in the Bible. So those of you who are um, free on Saturdays, feel free to drop in uh, the, the live class or, or the post recorded class. We're just trying to share, share some information and waking our family and friends up to the truth of what the world is doing when they celebrate uh, Christmas. So um, if you're not familiar with um, the Feast of, of Dedication that, that some of the Hebrews and you see the um, the Khazar Jews, or they're going into it too. You can find this feast listed in the New Testament and it's, it's found in um, the book of John, chapter 10, uh, 22. The Messiah did celebrate Hanukkah. It's known in the Hebrew as Hanukkah. Uh, it was translated as dedication. And it's a great time. It's, it's a time that the Most High showed us that he was still with us, even during our punishment, when he had to punish us with these other nations. He still was granting us some favor and we won back our temple and the Maccabee family, they took the temple back from the Greeks and they, they uh, cleansed the temple out, sanctified the temple and they relit the menorah known as the candlestick. So that's what the Feast of Dedication is about. If you're not familiar with it, again, our Messiah did celebrate this feast and we pay homage to our, our first of all, our father and also our brave ancestors who were zealous for the Torah, for the law, and they uh, won back our temple. So that's just a backstory on the Feast of Dedication. But going into, let's get right into this 25 days of idolatry. So let me get the presentation on the screen and uh, we get right into this. And I always, I wanna leave some time for Q&A or anybody to chime in with their, with their um, their experience, their their thoughts. If you celebrate it still, um, you know, feel free to to offer your position, and we could take a look at it. Uh, of course, based on on the Bible, that that's our uh, that's our rock. So let me get this presentation up for you. And it's always family. You know, we're at the mercy of technology. So if anything freezes up, just let me know so we can um, give this technology a, a minute to catch up. So let me switch that up. I don't need that. So this is 25 days of idolatry. Is Christmas holy? 25 days of idolatry is Christmas holy. And for us, um, 
I'm sorry, Shalom, Sister B, Shalom, Brother Anthony, Shalom to you all. We miss you. Pray the Most High is with you all. Uh, greetings to all that's on live. Uh, Dr. Griffin, we salute you as well. Those on Facebook, we salute you as as well. Um, so want to be gracious and, and pay homage to our family and friends. So uh, 25 Days of Idolatry, we're taking a look at is Christmas holy? And um, I grew up in the church. I know many of you did too. And uh, holy, holy pretty much was anything that the pastor said. If, if the pastor says that, you know, you can't get your, your jerry curl anymore, well, because it was unholy, then you couldn't get your jerry curl anymore. If the pastor said you couldn't go to the movies because the movies is unholy, then you couldn't go to the movies anymore. Any anything that the pastor deemed was unholy or or that you're not saved if you did it, then it was deemed unholy and we couldn't do it. But all praise be to the Most High Yah. Now that He's uh, uh, awakened a lot of us and, and He's returning our heritage and our culture to us, we understand that the word holy in the Hebrew actually means just to be set apart, and set apart is only. Um, given to us by the most high we can't determine what's holy or what's set apart we have to look at his word his commandments his instructions to find out what's holy or what's set apart to him so we want to take a look at christmas and if it's holy according to the most high most high yah so we got a, just a few objectives tonight to go over um one of the first objectives, and this is in no particular order, we're just going to, uh, as, as the information flows, you know, you guys, we are fluid, we let the most high move, but one of our objectives, we're going to try to see if we can flesh out the true meaning of Christmas. We're going to see if we can flesh that out. Um, another objective, again, in no particular order, we're going to go over the, the true meaning of the Christmas tree. We're going to go over the true meaning of the Christmas tree. Um, another objective we want to try to determine was the Messiah, the line of Judah, the Hebrew Israelite, the king of Jerusalem, was he really born in December? Was he really born in the month of December? And of course, as the title says, we try, we're going to try to determine by the most high standard, not by man's standard. We're going to try to determine by the most high standard, is this Christmas holy? Is this Christmas holy? So we have to get into Babylon the Great. Babylon the Great. And if you have your swords, we're going to get into, uh, of course, we're going to get into the, to, to the scriptures. But this is just found in Revelation chapter 18, verse 2. And the elder records, and he cried mightily with a great voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird so revelation is we know is one of our very last records and we don't see babylon the great fallen until the very end so a thinking man would say hmm why is babylon still around in the end times why is babylon still around in the end times now, if you do a, a quick little study and pull up any ancient map, you'll find where Babylon is. But Babylon is still with us, family. Babylon is known as Iraq. Iraq. If you do the word study, Iraq goes back to a Canaanite word that means rebellion. So Nimrod or, or his, his generation named the, named the country or the town Iraq because after the Most High destroyed the Tower of Babel, Nimrod's own soldiers rebelled against him. So the, the town became, or the city or the state became known as Iraq, which means rebellion. Now, what's significant to us in our time, Iraq or Babylon has fallen a couple of times. 
the first time or one of the most prominent times that Babylon the Great was, was taken was in 539 BC when the Most High raised up the Persians. And the Persians claimed Babylon for themselves. So Babylon fell in 539 BC. And then bring it up to our time, Babylon, which became known as Iraq. And you can see right here at the bottom right of your screen here where, where the, um, the uh, pointer is, this is Kuwait. So those of us who are mature enough to remember, uh, uh, what's his name, Saddam Hussein, mm -hmm. we, watched, we watched the United States take down Babylon, Iraq, and I think it was like three days. We watched, I was in high school, and we watched that whole war, the Gulf War of 91, we watched it on TV, a war. We seen Scud missiles flying all over, and the United States came and liberated Kuwait from Babylon. And ever since 1991, the United States was pretty much occupying Babylon. So Babylon the Great has fallen many times in the physical. So why don't we why do we find in in eschatology and end times prophecy Babylon the Great doesn't fall to the end when our king is coming back? That that's something a thinking man has to has to put on his plate. Babylon the Great doesn't fall to the very end. And to flesh this out, we're going to read from a a, a PDF you can find this PDF uh, free of charge online. And this is Two Babylons. This is the Two Babylons. And this book was written by a man named um, Alexander Hislop. Alexander Hislop is a, um, he's not a Catholic, so to speak. He, he, he broke off into another denomination of Christianity. But Alexander Hislop did some research and he started doing a lot of research about the Catholic Church, and he pretty much put the Catholic Church on Front Street, and he told the Pope and everybody, you guys are just another Babylon. Everything you're doing, you guys stole from Babylon. So we're going to get into a little bit of his book. Before we do that, let me go over um, some scripture with you. And get this on the screen. We want to go over. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna put an online Bible up. And um, I want to share with you this this precept. And it's one of the precepts we, we bring out every every year, trying to help our people. And um, some people see it, and some people don't. But um, it's our duty to, to bring this, this precept out and, and let the people do with it what they will. But this is Jeremiah 10 and verse 5. You know, I guess we'll pick it up at verse 3. Jeremiah 10 and 3. Jeremiah 10 and 3. And Jeremiah records, and of course he's he's speaking for the Most High, or the, or the Most High is, is speaking, Slocky? Yeah, this is the screen we're sharing. So this is the uh, Jeremiah, and of course, the Most High is speaking through Jeremiah. So this is our father talking. Jeremiah 10 and 3. For the customs of the people are vain. For one cuts a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. They deck it with silver and with gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers that it move not. Verse five, they are upright as the palm tree, but speak not. They must needs be born or carried because they cannot go, they cannot walk. Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil, neither also is it in them to do good. Now we've been bringing this out for years and we're, we're trying to share with our, our family and friends. When you take those, those Christmas trees inside your house, whether you go buy the traditional uh, pine tree or you, you, know, you opt for that, that plastic one, it doesn't matter. It's paying homage to Babylonian gods. And we're gonna get into the history of this tree. Many people have objected and said, well, this verse can't be talking about a Christmas tree because 
the tree is for Christ and Christ wasn't born here. Well, that leads to the question, the Berean question, if they're decorating a tree before Christ was even born, then how can your tree be for Christ? If they're decorating a a tree, a pine tree, or any tree, they it didn't say a pine tree, so Salaki, I don't, I don't want to add to scripture, but if they're decorating a tree hundreds of years before Christ is born, how can you say that what you're doing is for Christ? We have to we have to be Bereans and do our legwork. So I want to share something else with you that that came and that came up this week. And this is the reason why I have postponed um, Bible study. And um, the conversation, I said, you know what? I want to bring out some more meat to really help our brothers and sisters. So let me see if I got it up. I guess it don't matter. Give me a sec. I, I want to share something with you to show you what 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 we're up against. Whether you are um, whether you be a teacher or just someone trying to reach out to your family and friends, I want to share with you what you're up against and why we take what we do so very seriously, why we love on our family so very hard. So let me let me get this up one second, family. And, and this is not a, a, the Torah group. We don't operate in the spirit of, uh, of wickedness or of meanness. We operate in a spirit of love. We'll do anything we have to do that's righteous to, to get this information out to our families, to pull them out of pagan Christianity and to pull them out of pagan idolatry because we love our family. We want to save our family. We do not want to destroy our family. We use the Torah to restore life. That's what the Torah is for. The Torah is not to destroy, embarrass, and belittle people. The Torah is to preserve life and that's what the Torah group uses the Torah for. So I want to share with you a, a conversation I had earlier in this week. And the reason why I um, I had uh, postponed class to tonight, because uh, our people are, are in very bad shape. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so this, hopefully you can see, this is my Facebook page. Uh, hopefully you can still see the screen. So this is my Facebook page. And I had a I had a post earlier this week and I put on my post, you know, I have a little a series I guess I do called hard questions. And I ask these hard questions to get people thinking, not to embarrass people, not to be cute, not to be sarcastic. I ask hard questions because they're hard if you're going to be honest and take a look at what you're doing and what the Bible is saying. So this is a hard question I asked back on the seventh. I says, um, Israel is a tribal family. Names, customs, oaths, and scepters are passed down from generation to generation. Why is there no record of any Israelite being associated with a pine tree? Why is there no record of any Israelite being associated with a pine tree? And we know when the Messiah came, he says, I haven't come to do away with the law, the prophets, or anything. I'll come to make it all complete. It's running like a Swiss watch. But I want you, I want to share with you a comment from one of my brothers. And this is someone I'm intimate with. I know him. We hug each other's necks. So this is not to belittle him. And um, this is to help everyone. It's a teaching moment, and I pray that he can receive it with love. But this brother, he's a um, he's active in the church. He he has some kind of a leadership role in the church. He's not one of those ones that just go every once in a while. He's faithful. So he responds. This is what he responds here. Those oaths, customs, and scepters were also done away with when the Mashiach Yeshua or Yahusha fulfilled the prophecy and said it is finished he continues on he says the word became flesh resurrected and de and defeated all old testament traditions and we are heirs to the throne we are heirs to the throne for those who choose and those who are fishers of men not some men like the scribes said who are 
who are to heal on the Sabbath. He came to do away with all things. So this brother, um, and he said this with love. He wasn't he wasn't being mean or nothing, but he says that Messiah did away with the oaths, the customs, and the scepters. The Messiah did away with the oaths, the customs, and the scepters. Now we're just going to focus on the scepters. Scepters are um, alluding to the rulership, the kingship. So this this brother, who's a he's a, a devoted Christian. He's he's a very loving man, and uh, I know he don't he doesn't have any ill intentions, and neither do we. I want to show you what we're up against when we're going trying to educate people. He says that the Messiah did away with the scepter. Let's just focus on the scepter because the scepter refers to the rulership, the kingship, right? So let's just focus on that. Messiah did away with the scepter. Let's go to Luke, Luke chapter one. And I'm going to these verses, but I know I, I didn't have to share these verses with him because I know him personally. And this is not an attack on him. I know he knows what the Bible say. He may not know scriptures from a Hebraic perspective, but I know he knows what's in the Bible. So bear with me as I make this point. The first one we're going to go to just so you can hear it yourself. Luke one and thirty three. Luke 1 and 33. And just in case people are new, we'll start at 31. Luke 1 and 31. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shall, and shall call his name Yeshua. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest and the most high Yah shall give unto him the throne of his father, David. The Most High Yah shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Yaakov forever, and his kingdom there shall be no end. Now, I'm driving this point home, but my brother, he knows this. He knows this. So let's just get one more that refers to the scepter, and then I'll make my point, family. Let's get one more that refers to the, the never ending kingdom of King David who our Messiah is going to uh, sit on. Let's get one more because in our culture, everything must be established by what? Two or more witnesses, all praises queen. Mm -hmm. Everything must be established by two or more witnesses and it can't be you exegeting it, drawing it out. We need explicit verbiage. We need explicit examples. Too many men are adding to it. And when I say too many men, I'm referring to Israelites, and I'm referring to the Christians. You can't be drawing things out. We need two explicit witnesses to corroborate or support what you're saying. So let me get my second witness about the never ending throne of King David. Uh, this is Acts 2 and um, 30, what we want, 32. So we'll start at Acts 2 and 32. Acts 2 and 32. This is Yeshua or Yahawashai. This Yeshua have the most high raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. Verse 33. Therefore, being by the right hand of Yah exalted, and having received the Father, the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has shed forth this, which we now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he besets himself, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at, on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstools. So let me go. That's not the one I'm looking for. Which one I'm looking for? That is, that's the one to Acts 2. And, I'm sorry, I went too far down. It's a lock in family. Acts 2 and 30. This is what I wanted, family. Acts 2 and 30, therefore being a prophet and knowing that the Most High has sworn an oath. Now, if you go back to his post, we won't because we're not trying to destroy him. He did say that Messiah did away with the oaths. He said Messiah did away with the oaths and the scepter. Let's continue on here. Therefore being a prophet and knowing that the Most High has sworn with the oath to him that of the fruit of his lowings, 
according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. So we got two concrete witnesses that our Messiah, the line of Judah, the Hebrew Israelite, he's going to sit on the throne of David and he's going to rule Judah or the 12 tribes forever. And this is in the New Testament. And my brother, he knows this. So it would have been it would have been it would have been a waste of time for me to share this with him because me and him are intimate. I know he knows what the books say. He may not have the understanding that we're learning, but I know he knows these scriptures. So what point am I making, family? <clears throat> Your family and friends, uh, please mute yourself when you come in. Shalom, family. Your family and friends that you bring this information to, they're going to respond off emotion. Christmas is an emotional time of the year for everybody. So this brother, when he came responding to me, he wasn't responding with precepts. He wasn't responding according to the Most High's word. He responded with a knee-jerk reaction with his emotion because he don't want to give up the Christmas tree. He don't want to give up the trappings of Christmas. So this is what you're dealing with, family. That's why we, we're adamant, we're passionate about pulling our family out of this idolatry. But if you're not spiritually mature to have a civil conversation, then you have to let it pass and, and let someone else do the work because you're going to get th these types of, of responses. They're not going to respond with scripture. They're going to resp respond with emotion because it's a, it's a happy time of the year. And they don't understand that they're under a spirit. They're under a spirit that, that, wants them to celebrate christmas how do i know this well y'all been out right now every store every radio has the music on that music puts you into what spirit of christmas it puts you in the spirit of shopping and it doesn't only happen with christmas it happens with anything if you go to the gym those of you who uh you know me and gina used to try <laughs> but when you go to the gym you want to put on music that's going to pep you up and keep you energized. You put like me, I put on that old hardcore street music where I have to decompress after I leave the gym. Okay, that's over with because that music has a spirit in it. That music is made by men who've been smoking and drinking and the spirit that they, they made that music on is the spirit of death and murder and drugs and all kind of idolatry. So our family practicing Christmas, they don't realize it, but they're under the spirit of Satan, who is the father of Christmas. So they're not going to respond with scripture and precepts. They're going to respond from a place of emotion. So that's why you see us getting passionate and coming with, with authority, because we love our family and friends, and it's our job as sons of the prophets, we are the Esthers, we are the Moseses. It's our job, no matter how much it hurts, we have to stand uprightly and speak the truth. If you're wishy-washy eating some pork here, uh, I do a little bit of Christmas, I just take a little bit of a piece of turkey, you can't be a witness for them. They just made you backslide, be a hypocrite. But if you're mature enough to stand on your square, stand on your square in the power of Yeshua and witness to our family and friends and let them know that celebrating Christmas is not in the Bible, it's steeped in idol worship and it comes from Babylon. So with that being said, let's get into two Babylons and show you some of the trappings of Christmas. Let's show you some of the trappings of Christmas. So two Babylons, like I said, you can get this offline. I think Google Books has a copy of it. Um, it's, it's a free PDF. You don't have to buy anything. And we're not going to go over the whole book, just a couple highlights, just a couple highlights. And then we'll try to open up the floor for question, comments, and concerns. I'm gonna try my best to cover the objectives and then we'll open up the floor. And we're looking for righteous um, icebreakers that we can use
to 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 get our family and friends to, to to even think about having a conversation about Christmas. So this is two Babylon's, and this is chapter three. I pray that the screen is still uh, sharing. This is two Babylon's, chapter three, and this is festivals section one: Christmas and Lady Day. Christmas and Lady Day. So it opens up. Excuse me. It opens up, if Rome be indeed the Babylon of the apocalypse and the Madonna enshrined in her sanctuaries be the very queen of heaven, for the worshiping of whom the fierce anger of the Most High was provoked against the Jews in the days of Jeremiah. He just mentioned Jeremiah. We open up reading Jeremiah 10 and 5. Every scholar that's objective that hasn't been indoctrinated concedes that Jeremiah 10 and 5 or 10 and 3 is talking about the, the tree of, of Nimrod. Everyone concedes that. So uh, in the Jews in the days of Jeremiah, it is of the last consequence that the fact should be established beyond all possibility of doubt for that being once established, everyone who trembles at the word of God, I just read it as it is, everyone who trembles at the word of God must shudder at the very thought of giving such a system either individually or nationally the least continents or support so what he's saying is once we go over this history if you respect the word of god you have to ab abandon ship once you find out what we're about to find out tonight he says if you respect no i'm lying he says if you tremble at the word I mean, if you really fear the word of God or fear God, because his word is him, if you fear God, like, like we say we do, once you find out this history, you have to, what they, what they say, cease and, desist. cease and desist, you have to cease and desist immediately. You have to get that tree at your house. You have to get those gifts at your house. You have to take those decorations down because we are at the final hour. It's no time to say, oh, I do it next year. I start next year. Thank you. Thank you, Obadiah. But I'm going to go ahead. I done bought the gifts now. No. He's saying once you realize this history, you have to remove yourself from all allegiance and alliance with Babylon. It continues on here, says, something has been said already that goes far to prove the identity of the Roman and Babylonian systems. But at every step, the evidence becomes still more overwhelming. That which arises from comparing the different festivals is so peculiarly so. So he says, when you compare the festivals that the Romans are doing and what the Babylonians started, Rome ain't nothing but a new Babylon. Rome ain't nothing but a new Babylon. It continues on, he said, family, the festivals of Rome are innumerable, but five of the most important may be singled out for elucidation, viz. Christmas Day, Lady Day, Easter, the Nativity of St. John. Where is that in the Bible? We don't celebrate saints. We don't celebrate the birth of our apostles. And the Feast of the Assumption. Where is that at? Each and all of these can be proved to be Babylonian. Each and all of these can be proved to be Babylonian. He listed Christmas Day, family. Christmas Day can be proved to be Babylonian. Babylonian. And, and first, as to the festival in honor of the birth of Christ or Christmas, how comes it that that festival was connected with the 25th of December? There is not a word in the scriptures about the precise day of his birth. If it's not in the Bible, we can't practice it. If it's not in the Bible, we can't practice. Here's a pagan. A, a, a Gentile saying, it's not found in the scriptures, family. Christmas is nowhere in the scriptures. It says, or the time of the year when he was born. So his birth date is not in the Bible, nor the time of the year, what season he was born. What is recorded there implies that at what time soever his birth took place, it could not have been on the 25th of December. At the time that the angel announced his birth, 
to the shepherds of Bethlehem, they were feeding their flocks by night in the open fields. Now, no doubt the climate of Palestine, that's Israel, that's Jerusalem, is not so severe as the climate of this country. So he's saying, my country is not as bad as Palestine, but even there in Palestine, though the heat of the day be considerable, the cold of the night from December to February is very piercing. And it was not the custom for the shepherds of Judea to watch their flocks in the open fields later than about the end of October. So he's saying, just based on a farmer, based on a shepherd, we know that if, if the angels really appeared to those shepherds and they're in the fields with their flock, it couldn't have been December, February, because it's too cold in Jerusalem. So again, our elders, their words are ringing true. Men have left the truth and adapted fables, having itching ears, rather believing a lie than believe the truth. There's no way you get our Messiah, the line of Judah, born in December. Now, he mentioned that the angels appeared to the shepherds. So let's go back to the to the scrolls. Let's go and get let's get when the angel appeared to the uh to the shepherds. Let's go to Matthew uh chapter two. I want to bring something out. And all praise be to the Father by the blood of the Son. Um I've been reading this these things for years and it he's keeping his word. The most high is keeping his word to um increase knowledge in these end days. Because these verses we're about to go over, you've read them many times before, family. So this is Matthew 2, and we're going to drop down to, um, let's go to, where am I at? 13. Let's go to Matthew 2 and 13. So this man just verified those those shepherds couldn't have been in the, in the field in December. Uh, 2 and 13. Uh, we started at 12, Matthew 2 and 12. And being warned of the Most High in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Most High appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt or commit or Mizraim, flee into Mizraim and be thou there until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. Verse 14 is what I want you to highlight, family. Verse 14, when he arose, he took the young child and his mother by when? Night. By night and departed into Egypt. Now, we just got one witness that the shepherds don't keep their, their uh, sheep in, in the fields when it gets cold. Now, Joseph is going to wake his young wife and, and newborn child up in the dead of winter to travel at night. And when you do the study on your own, Bethlehem to Egypt is about 100 miles. So Joseph is going to make his wife and his newborn child travel in the cold of night. And then just using common sense, the angel gave them a head start on Herod because the Most High knew what Herod was about to decree. So they had maybe, depending on what time of the night, they had maybe a six, seven, eight hour head start before Herod gives the decree to kill every child two and under. So they have a head start, right, family? But Herod is the king. He has horses and chariots so they can get, gain ground very quickly which means Joseph has to be strategic and do most of his traveling to Egypt at night. So again, the most high is the master planner. He's gonna have his Messiah born in a cold time, knowing he was gonna to have to send the child and the parents to Egypt and they're traveling in the dead of night in winter time. Now, I wasn't gonna do this for the sake of time, but let me be obedient. Let me pull up, let me pull up, um, I'm going to pull up um, Jerusalem weather. 
right now. I'm gonna pull up Jerusalem weather and let's see what temperatures they got right now. If I could spell. I just wanna see what kind of weather they got right now. T today is, is December 10th uh, on, on the Roman calendar. And right now, uh, Jerusalem is eight hours ahead of us and it's 50 degrees in Jerusalem. Let's go to, um, when they say he was born, babe, the 25th. Let's see if we can go to um, the 25th. Let's go to let's go to December the 25th, and just just for giggles, let, let's just let's see what what the temperature is going to be like on December 25th. So this is a 10 day. Um, where we at? So here's here's Thursday. December 24th. Here, here's the so-called eve of our Messiah's birth. It's going to be a high of 60, a low of possibly 42. And that's during the day, family. The high during the day is going to be 60. And we know he's going to travel at night because he's hiding from Herod. So let's just take this 42 degrees. That don't make sense that Joseph and Mary is traveling with a newborn baby in the dead of winter in December. Now, Let's bring something out, and this is one of the precepts I'm about to show you that made me jump out my skin when I seen this. So let's go to Jeremiah uh, 36. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 36. Jeremiah chapter 36. So, so far we know that shepherds don't tend their flock in the cold weather and we know that jerusalem this time of the year is cold let's go to jeremiah 36 and we're going to pick it up at uh verse 22. jeremiah 36 and verse 22. jeremiah 26 36 verse 22. now the king sat in his winter house in the what month the ninth month the king sat in his winter house in the ninth month and there was a fire on the hearth burning before him so here's one of the wicked kings of jerusalem of judah and it's the ninth month and it's so cold in the ninth month that he has the fireplace burning so right now according to the romans it's december all of you know you guys are well read y'all know what desi means Desi means 10. That's why we're in our 10th month because originally Rome only had 10 months. Originally, this is their last month of their calendar. But once they got in contact with us, they added two more months. The point is, if according to our elders, the ninth month was so cold that it's a fire burning, what do you think is going on in the 10th month? And the most high is gonna have his, his, his long awaited messiah traveling with his parents in the in the dead of winter their story don't add up so if you can't find you can't pinpoint christ's birth in the scriptures what are you doing practicing this where are you getting these customs from we have to abandon ship family let's go back to the to the pdf let's go back to the pdf so he continues on here. This is a footnote just to add more fuel to the fire. There are two sorts of cattle with the Jews. There are the cattle of the house that lie in the city, the cattle of the wilderness that are they that lie in the pastures. On which one of the commentators observes, these lie in the pastures which are in the villages all the days of cold and heat and do not go into the cities until the rains descend. The first rain falls in the month of, this became March. This became March. The first rain falls in the month, month of March, which answers to the latter part of our October and the former part of November. From whence it appears that Christ must be born before the middle of October. We're going to bring out some more evidence during Shabbat before, on the uh, the Saturday before Christmas. I believe it's the 19th. We're going to bring out some more history 
to, to show you we know more exactly when when Yahweh Shah was born. He was born closer to late September, October. So that's enough for that point. That's enough for that point. It is in the last degree incredible then that the birth of Christ could have been could have taken place at the end of December. So if it's not in the Bible and you can't find any secular history to support a December birth, you're leaning towards fables, lies. You're practicing idolatry, paganism. Let's go to our next point. Let's see what we got on here. Okay. So I think we read that one. We did that one. Um, it's another one. No, no Israelite, no Jew would travel in winter. So Joseph ain't stupid and the Messiah is the master planner. Y'all know the warning from Messiah about our flight. Pray that your flight be not in winter. So that's another nail in the coffin. Yahweh Shai Yeshua was not born in the winter. He was not born in the winter months or the cold months. So let's move on to our next point. Let's see what else we got here. Okay, so let's go on then. He says, how then did the Romish church fix on December the 25th as Christmas day? How did Rome get December 25th as Christmas day? Why thus, long before the fourth century and long before the Christian era itself, a festival was celebrated among the heathen at that precise time of the year. Queen, can you get me, um, can you get me? Uh, I'm just drawing a blank. I'm just drawing a blank. That that precept, uh, Obinum, Obinum, learn not the way of the heathen. What, what is that? Learn not the way of the heathen. What, what precept is that? That's um, was that um, Ecclesiastic is um, um, no, no, that's you're not a person. Is, is Ecclesiastes twelve and ten, or is that uh, Proverbs um? Three and thirty-one or thirty-six. One or two. Let me look. Learn not the way of the heathen. Let me let me bring the Bible up. I'm just I, I want to say Jeremiah ten and five, but we would have went over. We would have ran into it. No, I know it's not. I think it's Jeremiah. I think it's still in Jeremiah. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, Salak. If, uh, uh, yeah, so we open up with Jeremiah 10 and 2. Learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven. So this 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 Gentile himself is bringing out that the Romans had a, a pagan festival already in play 400 years before Christ even came into the picture. They had a, a pagan or heathen festival, and we got a direct precept Actually, this is a Torah law. This is a direct Torah law from the Most High saying, learn not the way of the heathen. People think the commandments are only the only Torah laws. Torah just means instructions, direction. Everything the Most High says to us to do and not do is Torah. So in Jeremiah 10 and 2, when he says, learn not the way of the heathen, it means don't copy the heathens. So this is a Torah law, family. Don't be beguiled by these people saying, oh, it's only 613 laws. They can't even verify that. And, and not only that, everything the Most High told us to do and not do is Torah. It's Torah to keep us alive. So let's go back to the PDF. A festival was celebrated among the heathen at that pre precise time of the year in honor of the birth of the son of the Babylonian queen of heaven. So this is what they're celebrating and they don't know it. They're celebrating Tammuz. They're celebrating Tammuz. Let's drop down for the, for the um, sake of time. Um, I'm just gonna read the highlights. I don't have time to go every, over everything. That Christmas was originally a pagan festival is beyond all doubt. I'll read that again. That Christmas was originally a pagan festival is beyond all doubt. That this 
that I'm so slack here that the time of the year and the ceremonies with which it is still celebrated proves its origin. In Egypt, the son of Isis, the, the Egyptian title for the queen of heaven, was born at this very time, about the time of the winter solstice. The very name by which Christmas is properly known among ourselves, Yuli Day. Yuli Day proves at once its pagan and Babylonian origin. Yuli is the Chaldean name for an infant or little child. And as the as the 25th of December was called by our pagan Anglo-Saxon ancestors, Yuli Day or the Child's Day and the night that preceded it, Mother Night, long before they came in contact with Christianity. So this writer is saying, listen, I know my, who my ancestors are. And my ancestors had a Yuli Day long before they knew about some uh, Messiah born in Jerusalem. Because these people are, are Europeans. So this Christ Day, this Christmas Day has nothing to do with us. It's them trying to Christianize paganism. They're trying to Christianize. They're trying to clean up paganism. Um, let's get some more here. It says, um, among the Sabians of Arabia who regarded the moon and not the sun, as the visible symbol of the of the favorite object of their idolatry, the same period was observed as the as the birth festival. Thus, we read in Stanley's Sabean philosophy on the 24th of the 10th month, that's December, according to our reckoning, the Arabians celebrated the birth of the Lord, that is the moon. The Lord moon was the great object of Arabian worship. And that Lord Moon, according to them, was born on the 24th of December, which clearly shows that the birth which they celebrated had no necessary connections with the course of the sun. So every one of, every one of these pagans has their version of what they're doing around the winter solstice. But we can't find this in our scrolls anywhere, anywhere. Let's go and see what else we got highlighted here. Okay, so we're going to end with this and we're going to open up the floor. I got a couple more precepts and then we'll open up the floor. We're going to read this long paragraph. It says, this was precisely the way in which, according to Berasus, Ber 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 the drunken festival of the month, Thabeth, answering to our December, in other words, the festival of Bacchus, was celebrated in Babylon. The festival of Bacchus was celebrated in Babylon. It was the custom, says he, during the five days it lasted for masters to be in subjection to their servants. And one of them ruled the house clothed in a purple garment like a king. The purple robed servant was called Zoganes, the man of sport and wantingness. Anybody ever had a um, went to an ugly Christmas uh, sweater party? That's where they get this from. When the servants put on mock purple and became a mock king over his over his master. The ugly sweater parties are imitating Babylon. All this information been hid from us. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. It says and answered exactly to the Lord of Misrule. That in the dark ages was, was chosen in all popish countries to head the revels of Christmas. The wassailing bowl of Christmas had its precise counterpart in the drunken festival of Babylon. So wassailing bowl of Christmas, the wassailing bowl family is that big bowl of eggnog. That's the wassailing bowl. So if you ever had eggnog around Christmas, it's all, it's all copying off, Rome copied off Babylon. So if you ever been to a, a party and they had a big bowl of anything to drink, it's coming from Babylon. It's coming from Babylon. It says, um, and many of the other observances still kept up among ourselves at Christmas came from the very same quarter. The candles in some parts of England lighted on Christmas Eve 
and used so long as the festive season lasts, were equally lighted by the pagans on the eve of the festival to, of the Babylonian God to do honor to him. For it was one of the distinguishing peculiar, peculiarities of his worship to have lighted wax candles on his altars. The Christmas tree, now so common among us, was equally common in pagan Rome and pagan Egypt. In Egypt, that tree was the palm tree. In Rome, it was the what? The fir tree. The palm tree denoting the pagan Messiah as Baal Tamar. The fir, the fir referring to him as Baal Perith. The mother of Adonis, the sun god and great uh, mediatorial divinity was mystically said to have been changed into a tree and went in that state to have brought forth her divine son. If the mother was a tree, the son must have been recognized as the man as the man branch. And this and this entirely accounts for the putting of the Yule log into the fire on Christmas Eve and the appearance of the Christmas tree the next morning as zero zero asta the seed of the woman which name also signified a inogenia whatever that means or born of the fire he he has to enter the fire on mother night that he may be born the next day out of it as the branch of god or the tree that brings all divine gifts to men but why it may be asked does he enter the fire under the symbol of a log to understand this it must be remembered that the divine child born at the winter solstice was born as a new incarnation of the great god after that god had been cut in pieces on purpose to revenge his death upon his murderers now the great god cut off in the midst of his power and glory was symbolized as a huge tree stripped of all its branches and cut down almost to the ground family we can go on and on this chapter christmas has nothing to do with messiah it's not found in the bible um i just let's uh, let's just end with this paragraph and open up the floor it says um therefore the 25th of december the day that was was observed at rome as the day when the victorious god reappeared on earth was held at the natalis invicti solis the birthday of the unconquered sun. Now the Yuli log is the dead stock of Nimrod, deified as the sun god, but cut down by his enemies. The Christmas tree is Nimrod Redivivus, the slain god come to life again. In the light reflected by the above statement on customs that still linger among us, the origin of which has been lost in the midst of horror and antiquity, let the reader look at the singular practice still kept up in the South on Christmas Eve of kissing under the mistletoe bow. That mistletoe bow in the, in the Druidic superstition, which as we have seen was derived from Babylon. So each and every one of us, we all guilty of this. This is not coming down and thinking we're better because we know we we know knowledge now. Remember uh, Martin um, Salaki. Remember um, Malcolm X quote, and I'm paraphrasing. Don't be so quick to condemn others who don't do as you do or or as quickly. For at one point you didn't know what you know. So we're extending our love and our patience and, and our zeal for our family to let them know. Everything you're doing, the mistletoe, the Yule log, the uh, eggnog, the, the uh, carols, the Christmas carols, the ugly sweater, it all comes from Babylon, that great whore that's going to fall in the end. Um, so the mistletoe bow and Judic superstition, which, as we have seen, was derived from Babylon, was a representation of the Messiah, the man, the branch. 
The mistletoe was regarded as a divine branch, a branch that came from heaven and grew upon a tree that sprung out of the earth. So family, uh, we're gonna continue with 25 days of idolatry and we're trying to, with love and with the patience of Hamashiach, show our family and friends, you can't whitewash, you can't Christianize, you can't make holy something that's profane. And with that precept, I'm gonna to go to Isaiah 5, I believe, in 18. And then if you have your questions or comments, please uh, be ready to unmute yourself. And we, let's have a dialogue is Christmas holy according to the Most High? Let's go to Isaiah chapter 5. I'm going from memory, so uh, bear with me, family. Isaiah 5, I think it's 5 and 18, maybe. Yeah, yeah, 5, 5, it is 5 and 20. So this is Isaiah 5 and 20. And again, family, when you read Isaiah and Jeremiah or any prophet, you're reading the words of the Most High. These prophets didn't write these words, they just recorded them. So listen to what your father says when you try to make anything good out of Christmas. Isaiah 5 and 20, woe. Family, the Hebrew word in woe, is not even a word, it's a sound. It's a sound, it's like, uh, what kind of sound we got, babe? Um, it's like, uh, sheesh. sheesh, yeah. Sheesh. So when you read woe in, in the scriptures, it's like, it's like, man, like, whoa, like, shit. Yeah, how is Shai's coming to kill you? That's what woe means. Woe means like, sheesh. That's what woe means, family. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. So when you say Christmas, I don't care what you say. Christmas is holy. Christmas is a beautiful time of the year. Woe to you, family. Woe. And with that, I yield my time. I open up the floor for questions, comments, and concerns. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. So I got a question. So, or just a comment, I guess. Uh, with all the uh, feast days in Leviticus, um, not one of them speak of, of, of celebrating uh, the Most High's birthday. So... I'm just, um, the comment is, we were never really taught in the church to, to, to go over those feast days, to celebrate those feast days. So, uh, what, what are you trying, what you- Just making a comment, like, oh, we were yeah. never, we were never taught to, to celebrate these feast days in Leviticus. Leviticus. Fem, did y'all hear Gina? Did y'all hear her comment? Yes. All praises, all praises, and her. Yeah, her so go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I was saying I heard. Yeah, so her point was valid. We we get righteous, we get righteous, really holy, set apart days given by the Most High in Leviticus twenty three, and then because of our uh, righteous elders, our our matriarchs and patriarchs, we have two more that we celebrate. Uh, the first one that was added by the righteous uh, matriarch uh, Hadassah, who's known as Esther, is the Feast of uh, Pariam. Some people know it as Purim. So Purim or Pariam means lots. So that's one that we added. And then the one that some of our family and friends are going to tonight, uh, Hanukkah, dedication was another one. So when you return to our customs, when you reclaim our identity, we have more party days with the Most High. The Most High don't have no problem with us partying. And yes, at our at our feast days, there's wine. And if you choose a little strong drink, guess what? You're among family and friends. So if you get a little bit too tipsy, you ain't got to worry about somebody knocking you out, robbing you. You ain't got to worry about going to fornicate with nobody's wife because the brother's going to take you home to your wife. So Gina's point is valid. When we When we learn these precepts, when we come back to our culture, we have more good times with the Most High and it's leading to salvation. Because that's that's another thing I want to get into. And and Gina, Gina made a good point. There's nowhere in the Bible that says we are to celebrate his birthday, right? But some men and some Israelites, I see them all the time, they're adding to the book telling you what sin is. 
they're they're, they're in all kind of sins wearing pants is sin uh um oh it's like it's not in the book so if you can't show me a torah law thou should not celebrate birthdays then you can't say that's a sin but the point i want to lay on your heart celebrating messiah's birth it seems to be a noble thing but celebrating his birth is like extra credit family and if you ain't did the the, the mandatory minimums you can't get the extra credit it's, it's like it's like in school you don't know none of the, the 10 questions but but you got that extra credit so you're just going to do the extra credit what is your teacher going to tell you that's extra so you got a zero on the test so even if we if we do want to celebrate Yahweh Shai Yeshua's birthday, that's fine. If you don't took care of the required, and then B, you can't do it. You can't do nothing for the Messiah that's connected to the pagans. Nothing. In any that was a good uh, comment, uh, Queen. In, anybody else has a question, comment, or concern? I'm calm, calm, yeah. Um, I mean, even oh, Shalom. Um, happy Shalom. feast of dedication. Um, happy feast of dedication, everyone. Miss um, uh -huh. I um, I um, it's why I have like a few questions because I most I brought something to my attention. I want to say the last night or the night before last in scripture. Um, but um, as far as saying the word Hanukkah, now is that like Talmudic or because I know in scripture it says feast of dedication, it doesn't say Hanukkah. I know, um, like that's like a Jewish word. So, like, is is that actually a pagan word? Because someone had a discussion, and uh, so another, um, you know, sister was trying to um, guess chest house. Another sister, like, oh, that's a pagan word, et cetera, et cetera. I was like, well, I mean, we could we could play schematics all day. Well, uh, at the end of the day, English is not the most house language. It's not, it's not it's not the holy language. So, if that's the case us speaking every day is, is paganism. Like we've cast the spells and everything else because we don't really know what the, the true meaning behind these words that we're saying. So like, we pray that the most high have mercy on us while, you know, while we communicate with, with each other. But I don't know, just like, I understand as far as wanting to be separate and and even um, it was um, it was something I was, it was a teaching somebody actually sent me. They were trying to say that fringes were, um, I don't know, we had a conversation about that. But in, and but my thing is, is 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 just that it was like um they they took something from the Talmud and they were saying that um they said you know this had a third about ham. I'm like, we're not ham. You know, there, there was like the ham was a savage and you know he did um different things that was um you know abominable um upon the ship. You no, know, excuse me, upon um art. And my thing is this, first of all, I don't think the most high or know would have allowed that happening, let him you know say him knowing something like that. I don't like that's just folly to me. And um, second of all, I mean, they're going to say, I guess they were trying to identify us as Shem, but I mean, of course they're going to, I mean, it's Ham, but because they're trying to take, try, they're trying to say that it's Shem. They're definitely not going to say that it's Japheth because that'll definitely put them out the, you know, they'll put their foot in their mouth. So them doing that, I, I understand why they, why they, uh, you know, made it that way because they described us like, you know, with nappy hair and big noses and like they were just, I guess they're trying to describe us, but at the end of the day, like all through scripture, we all do look like, but we're not of the same lineage, not of the same stock. But um, that was just, I just actually do have a question. Um, also I know I was rambling a little bit, but um, is saying Hanukkah or, or a set of feast dedication is that like um, not saying I said anything, but um, you know, is that wrong? Okay, to your first question, I just used the uh, Blue Letter Bible and um, just type. I, I see you, Doc. I, I, I'm coming for you. Um, just using the blue letter bible and, and typing the word dedication the first instance come up is number seven and, and 84. just click on tools and um just give the internet a, a chance you click on tools and it breaks it, it parses the uh the scripture out for you and um you see right here it says dedication and it says it's, it's using a ch and that comes from the the german the, the, the germanic language and there, there's is shanaka when you yeah, click yeah. on strong's h2598 you can get the you can get the root of it 
Now they they put the the car in there because they're Germans. They they those those Yiddish people. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, kind of. I was about to say. I was like, so it is basically it it, it is um a Yiddish word more than more than the Hebrew word because I, I guess that's that's what the argument was that it wasn't a like original or official Hebrew Hebrew word. No, it, you see the root right here is uh twenty five ninety six. It's Hanukkah, Hanukkah. Hanaka is dedication. So if you you click on this root word, the etymology right here, yeah. the, the the root of it is Hanaka, Hanaka. So it is a Hebrew word. It means dedication. Hanaka means dedication. Cool. Yeah, because I I mean when when the question first was brought to me, I was like, it, it just means the same thing. It just said it in a, in a different yeah. form. And I did I did this is what I was looking. I guess the most I um you know put put the spirit upon me to remember it because I, I was like from what I can recall. Hanukkah is just um, the Yiddish form of, 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 of you know, of, um, of another way of saying feast dedication. I, I didn't yeah. go into, you know, the strong number, but okay, that, that makes sense. Cause I, I didn't, cause my blue, I, I, it, I don't know, I have that one and I have another one. This one, this one right here on the screen, it, it like, it, it, I don't know, it's weird to me cause it, like, it'll pull some things up, but the other one will pull everything up. So and like, also you can use, um, for your second witness, your second witness, you can use uh, studylight.org and, and type in the same word. Hanaka is the root. Hanaka is the root. It means dedication. To your second comment about the Talmud, what's going on, those Yiddish, those German, Polish people, when they got in our land in 1948, they took as many as our uh, records, even by the wicked rabbis who called the Talmud is, and they, they added stuff to their records. So anything they're throwing in there about we're being Hamites and all that stuff, that's yeah, that's yeah. the racism part. Yeah, 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 I, so, yeah I, I know that. I would just, I would just, oh, my goodness, I just drop something. I'm going all over the floor, my fault. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I knew that was their way of, uh, you know, you know, bashing us or making us seem evil, you know, and, and also covering their tracks. But it, it was just amazing, like, that part came up in the teaching. Like, you know, I guess he was reading out the time mode and he was um, explaining you know, um, you know, uh, you know, he was giving his explanation for that teaching, but it was like he was just saying how they took, you know, uh, we, we like, you know, those of the, those those of us who are learned, you know, we know that you know they uh, hate the Messiah, you know, they, they hate us, um, you know, that they, you know, that they use these different tools to um, to demonize us, you know, that was just another way for them to, to demonize us, and it was just, you know, it's like it's like I say all ties in, but it was like it just, it, you know, put it was like a light bulb. You know, like, oh, okay, like you know, because I like, because I, because I, because I think they, well, I believe they from Jaffa, of uh, Greece, and all that, so they're not going to expose that they're, you know, that they're not um, the most high chosen people. You know, uh -huh. they, you know, so and then they, that's why they're going to put though all of him off on us, and they're trying to take, you know, Shem's lineage. I was like, it, it makes sense how he broke down the teaching. Um, it was one more question. Um, I remember um, someone going over teaching. I, I'm not 100% sure. I actually would have to find the scripture or if someone can lead me to the scripture. Um, I'll read it for myself, definitely. Um, now, are we supposed to observe the first and last day as the Sabbath for, for Hanukkah? Or is it just a regular feast day? Because I was told that we would observe the first and the last day as, as a Shabbat. Uh, the first day is a holy convocation and the last day are holy convocations. They um they can't well based on my understanding and how we're doing our uh, our calendars, if if the feast starts on the twenty fifth, the twenty fifth is not a Shabbat because our 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 Shabbats fall eight, fifteen, twenty two, and twenty nine. So having holy convocations doesn't equate to Shabbat. Shabbat Shabbat, okay. Shabbat comes from the Hebrew word Shabbat, which means seven and which means oath. So some people. Don't um some people misunderstand the word sh Shabbat, what it means. Shabbat most times means covenant or oath. But let me go. I got I got one more hand raised and it, then I come back to you. Uh, no problem. Uh, um Ak, you got a um preach, you got a question or comment? Uh yes. Uh, first of all, shalom, everyone. Uh, oh, shalom. uh it's a blessing to be able to, you know, be a be among those who seeking knowledge and uh, seeking to uh, serve God. I appreciate uh, your efforts and everything. is is much needed in these last wicked days and hours. Um, I just was um, pointing out a couple of things that I that I was hearing. Um, 
it's like we got to be kind of be careful with the word idolatry. You know what I mean? Um, everything is in idolatry, even as the young man was speaking about uh, people using uh, certain verbiage, you know what I mean? Whether you were speaking of different origins of words, you know what I mean? Because um, words are just words at the end of the day. And it's, it's, it's the intent and the thought behind the word which would make a word to be idolatrous. Um, point being, uh, when we uh, look at the definition of um, <clears throat> when we look at the definition of what will be idolatry, idolatry is always pointed out by something that replaces God. Uh, if you were to speak in, of, you know, I mean, of an, an item that you were saying was an idolatrous item, if you take that item and that's your God, and I mean, like a lot of times, if you went to Sunday Sunday church, and everything you used to hear the preachers used to say, you're making an idol out of your car. That is a, a play on words, which it's possible that you could do that, but nine times out of 10, nobody is worshiping their car as God. And so if you're not worshiping your car as God, just because you like your car a lot, it's not an idol. And so uh, that, that's a very um, important point of fact when it comes to what an idol is. An idol is something that replaces God. When Israel turned their back on God for an idol, they were turning their back on God for something else. It wasn't just because they had an object. You know what I mean? The, the object was meant to be their God and they were looking to get favor from the God. It was something that they learned from their neighbors or enemies, but uh, that by and by is where it is. <clears throat> and as myself um, from the scriptures, I also do look to, to show love to brethren. And I stand on a, a couple of scriptures which speak toward that. Uh, and in the Bible, you know, said in three or uh, three sentences, you know, let every word be established. Uh, we have Romans 14 and 14, which tells us who are we that we judge another man's servant, you know, to God he stands or to God he falls. So um, we really can't be too harsh in our judgment of other people. Or it's just we got to make sure that we are right. And that um, we, we make sure we, we're not getting off the path. And then uh, there's Colossians 2 and 16. Hold on, hold on. Uh, let, me, let me go to the first one. Uh, the first one was Romans 14 and 4. Romans 14 and 4. Romans 14 and 4. Let me just so the people can see it. Okay. You can start up first if you want continuity with what the conversation was, where it was coming from when it got to verse 4. Okay, so. Uh, Romans 14 and 1, him that is weak in the faith receive ye, but not not to doubtful disputations, for one believe that he may eat all things. So already we get the context, this 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 uh, parable or this passage he about to go into is not talking about um, feast days, it's talking about a dietary situation. So we can't apply this to uh, unholy feast days. We got to... Um, come up with our uh our acronym can can i kick it so when we when we're when we teach precepts when we teach the bible old and new testament we got to keep it in context and this this passage that you're going into referring to it has nothing to do with uh feast days it's just talking about if if a man is, is is weak about your about your what you're eating and and then i i know most people think this is about uh unclean and clean foods but to an Israelite, any unclean food is not food. So this is not even talking about unclean foods. This is talking about food that is uh, clean, that's approved by Yah, and you're still not eating it. So we gotta, when we look at these precepts, especially the New Testament, we got to keep things in context. And yeah. um, can, I, can I stop you there, though, one second? Yeah. Um, but let, you, let me finish, you, let me finish okay. the, uh, the, the verse you read first. Uh, okay. Romans 14 and 4. Who art thou that judges another man's servant? To his own master he stands or falleth, yea, he shall be holden up, for Yah is able to make him stand. Now go ahead, you had a point? Yeah, the point is um, that this scripture fits into what we were saying, because if you look at the next verse after, if you continue on, mm -hmm. like read five. Uh, Romans 14 and five. One man esteems one day above another, another esteem of every day alike. Let everyone may be fully persuaded in his own mind. 
So this, if you read it as it's written, it seems like your point is valid that you can't judge another man about how he's living. But we did a class, we brought out a class and it's, it's on our YouTube channel. I think, what's the name of the class? Um, the Birth of Christianity. And uh, we're gonna do a follow up to it. But if, if you go to the YouTube channel and take a look can at- Can you send me the link in a text message? Yeah, the Birth of Christianity, we brought out that it's dangerous when you read the New Testament without understanding of the old, because A, Paul or none of the apostles have the authority to overwrite what the prophet spoke by the most high. That's that's A. B, B, these New Testament letters have been remastered several times. Actually, when they were first found, they were first found when the Israelites were kicked out the land by um, the wicked uh, Emperor Hadrian. So people think that we disappeared after 70 AD when Titus ransacked the, the temple. We didn't, all the Israelites didn't disappear. There was remnants still in the land. And what happened, we like about 120 something, we regrouped and they had a, they had a, a, another revolt against Rome. It's called the Bar Kaaba revolt. And during the Bar Kaaba revolt, they hyped up one of the Israelites and, and the rabbi said, he's the Messiah that we've been waiting on. That's what Bar Kaaba means. Bar Kaaba is Aramaic. Can you spell, for, can you spell that? I, I'm, I'm not catching what you're saying. Bar, Bar Kaaba, B-A-R, Kaaba, uh -huh. Bar Kaaba revolt. And Bar Kaaba hey. is Aramaic for the son of the star. So these rabbis, these wicked Talmudists hyped the people up to, to convince them that this man, he's the son of the star we've been waiting on. And, uh, and um, <clears throat> they got the people excited to revolt against Rome. And this is about 120 one something, 130 something AD. So after they got hyped up and revolted against Rome, the wicked uh, Emperor Hadrian, sometimes they spell his name with an uh, with a H, sometimes they just spell it with an A. Hadrian says, you, you Jews are just rebellious people. We Romans been kind to you and y'all still won't, won't bow down. So know what? All y'all get out. So the, the, the remnant of Israel that was left got kicked out and expelled. They wasn't allowed to come back to the land. That's when Hadrian changed the name to Palestine. He says, I'm going to remove all remembrance of, of David and Jacob. And he named our land Palestine. So what's significant about this period are as, as the people are kicked out, expelled, that's when these Romans, AKA Catholics, AKA Christians, that's when they found the apostles letters. So for almost two to 300 years, these, these letters we now have as the new Testament, they've been edited by pagans. So when you, when you bring this precept right here, who are, let's just deal with verse four. Who art thou that judges another man's servant? So we can see the, the we can see the pagans, the, the pagans, uh, please uh, mute yourself, family. We can see the pagans' uh, fingerprints all on the New Testament letters. So watch this. Romans 4 and 14, who art thou that judges another man's servant, right? And this is Paul speaking, right? So let's go and get another one of Paul's quotes. If I could type. So this is how we kick it, family. This is how we keep it in context. So we got one verse, Paul saying, who are thou to judge another man's servant? But then he sends another letter to, to other Israelites telling them, why are y'all taking your brothers to these pagan courts? Know ye not? that ye shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to life? So using textual criticism, op, if we're gonna stand on Paul, I can't respect nothing Paul says because he's contradicting himself. Paul is forked tongue, but we we all praise be to the most high Yah through the blood of Yahweh Shai. We know Paul is not forked tongue. We know the pagans have tainted his, his records because they were these pagan Christians who became known as Christians, they were arguing with the with the Israelites who were known as Jews or Talmudists, and that's why they tainted Paul's letters because the Jews, the Israelite or, or the rabbis, the Jews, they didn't accept the, the New Testament. 
they yeah. kept throwing the prophets up into the Romans' face and telling them that these records or these promises are only to the Israelites. So that's why these pagans poorly butchered Paul's letters. And that's why you got this contradiction. If Paul's going to tell the Romans that you, you can't judge another man's servant, and now he's telling the Corinthians, no, you're not. You're going to judge angels. Paul's double-minded. What that's is this? Not, that's what not this? true. Oh, oh, we just read it. We, no, we just read yeah, it. Huh? You, you're misunderstanding what he's talking about there. Um, oh, when you, I, I'm not. It's in black I, and white. I, okay. It's black and white. He said, no, you're not. You're, and you just said he was talking about taking them to court. He's not talking about judging a person's character. He's talking about judging a situation. And basically, like, I say, I say, look, what they were doing, if, if you know the, um, the text of what was going on, is uh, Brother Obadiah owes me money. And instead of taking it up among themselves, they were going to the Romans, going to take it to people to court where you could send somebody to jail for, for uh, having owing debts and stuff. And he was saying, uh, had there any of you having a matter against each other, go before the world. You should be able to judge this out between yourself, not putting judgment on a person, but judge a situation of what's the right thing to do, who owes what, who's going to pay up, or, or is it going to be forgiven or whatever like that. That's um, and then he speaks of that in, in the um, in the um, at the end of the age that we would judge angels. And he said, you know, and we so we have the faculty about us to be able to judge things that pertain to this life, not judging somebody of saying who's righteous or who's not. That's that's what the other verse is talking about. Judging somebody's righteousness, saying that well, you eat this, so you're unrighteous, or you 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 um, celebrate this day. And you're not righteous. That hold is on. a different type of judgment. Hold on, hold on, uh, hold on, because let's go back. Because how much more things pertain to this life? So we we according to Paul was was here in black and white. I'm gonna take this at face value. We have enough. We have enough uh, righteousness to judge the angels who 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 stand before Yah. And how much more? So we can't we can't judge things that pertain to this life. Now you just said let's go back to. Uh, I don't want to. I don't want to, uh, his letter's been butchered bad enough. Let's make sure we got what he said, because you just said that he's talking about righteousness. And when we read what's written here, he never mentioned righteousness. He never mentioned right. You just added righteousness. I don't see righteousness nowhere in here. So that's, that's what, that's leaning toward, that's exegeting or, or inserting things into the text that's not there. Well, so, um, if if Paul is hold on, let me let me let me finish this thought. Okay. If Paul is saying you can't judge another man's servant about food, ah, he's talking about food here. He's talking about food, and then he's and talking then, about and then according to what's here, and you see right here, ah, you see this a like. You see, can you see the screen? Yeah, I see it. You see how a like is italicized? Yes, that was added. That's a clear. That's an interpolation. So Paul right. didn't really Paul didn't really say say it like this. That's 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 a now B. If Paul is saying you can't esteem another day over a other, and we got holy feast days, he just contradicted the prophets because that's what holy means. Holy means set apart. So this this is how we see the the Gentiles' fingerprints all in these New Testament writings. That's why I tell people, slow down and wait till you have a strong foundation, which is the Old Testament, before you get into these New Testament writings. Because even, and I know you, you're well read, you know what, what Peter said about Paul's letters. Many, many unlearned wrestle with his letters. On top of, on top of him already having an advanced writing style, we have years and and. I could run off at least five different pagans who've edited his letters. So if we keep this in context, Roman 14, he's saying, talking about food, you should be able to, to, to judge and discern between food. And then Corinthians, he's saying, you're going to judge angels, but you don't have the common sense to, to judge between righteous uh, or, or, or a, a common meal. These things are oil and water. They're they're two different art, and Paul's contradicting himself. And, and this is just one. Uh, we can go on and on. You have to you have to keep it in context. We have, and you can't discount 
you have to I could, I'm going to share with you the link about the birth of Christianity. Um, I'm, I'm, y'all willing, I'm going to do part two in, in January uh, or February when we go back. But you have to really learn the, the true puppet masters of the letters. What you're reading here, what we're reading here are not the, the original letters. And we see we right now, right in front of on your face right I, here, I, the I alike, I don't, the italicized. I, I know that that word has been put in there, the alike, because because in languages, every word doesn't translate. Like if I was to say to you, s'il vous plaît, there's a lot of words in there in French, but all it means in English is please. But there's three different words there. So if I was to really, try, I would have to put it in italicis, what you would have to put in italicis, what I said, but even even though what I said was please, but from s'il vous plaît, um, has other words in there that come to meaning but when you put it in english it only means please and so okay. that's how languages work and then so language languages can be tricky you're very right about that um but um i don't i don't know um who, who told you that the scriptures were were not found before because if you study the writings of the early church fathers even from as early as 100 a.d they were already quoting from the New Testament in their writings, so we know that they had the scriptures of the New Testament, and um, from first, second century, or second century. Uh, I get I get those numbers mixed up there. I think it's back there. No, well, I second got you. I understand. Two hundred A.D. You know, I mean, that would be. I think that would be second century, but or whichever whichever way that because first century is before one hundred. Yeah, so you second know, century on, the the early church fathers that who wrote writings were quoting from. So they actually had, they had to have the manuscripts to be able to, to get quotations from them. Do you, do you know the, uh, the first person uh, to define the letters and what year was it? No, I don't know who was first. So there, there's a man credited to having the, the first collection or the, or the most, he had the most of the, of, of the apostles letters. And he found those letters. He was in, he accredited. He's accredited to finding those letters in 150 A.D. So, and then some man says, well, based on the timeline of who was who was um, the Pope at the time, they're they're assuming that, again. That, hold, that, that can't be right. There's no. There hold on, no hold, 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 let me finish. Let, let me finish. Okay. Let me finish, please. He says. So then they did they did a study and they said based on the timeline of. Who, he this man mentions one of the popes and he says based on that pope he says well this man had to have these letters at least by 113 AD so you're right the letters been around since the first century I, I never said they wasn't around in the first century but when you're when you when you mention the church fathers uh those church fathers are not apostles they're not Hebrews they're not Israelites those are Roman Catholics who hijacked our uh bayats, our places of worship so the church fathers are, are pagans and and i'm gonna send you the link we brought that all out we brought that out how the doctrine that the law has been replaced and the loss was only for the jews that's the church fathers you're speaking of but let, let's stay on topic of what we're here yeah, for tonight yeah, definitely yeah i don't want to get too far off for you i want to yeah. finish the, just the three, i just want to touch three scriptures you you <laughs> mentioned something else about um you was going into being careful Colossal. um you were mentioning about being uh, careful with using the word idolatrous and idolatry. Oh yeah, yeah, I did. So before, let, let, let's let's deal with that. Who's the reason for the season right now? Yeshua. Well, no, 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 no. That no, Yeshua is not the reason for the season. Who's the reason for the season according to this world right now? Oh, who's the prince of this uh, of this the world? No, who's Say, the reason for the season right now? What is the world saying? Who's the reason for the season? Jesus. Jesus. Jesus is the reason for the season. So let's deal with that. That means Jesus has replaced the Messiah and he's replaced the most high. We just we just went over history that says the Messiah, whether whether you call him Jesus or, or Yeshua. The, the true begot, only begotten son was nowhere born in December. So if you're celebrating a, a, a entity other than the true line of Judah, that's not idol worship. That's you don't adore you don't adore Jesus. 
you adore Jesus, don't you? Or you are this 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 is a void because I'm not trying to get you caught well, up in word games. You are you are you are doing you you are Jesus is, Christ. Jesus is God according to my to my, uh, to my to my thinking. Jesus and God are one in, in, in equal in, equal. So okay, so we're, we're not going to go into that conversation because that's right. a whole different conversation. That's a whole other thing. But yeah. If if we got concrete resources that Christ Messiah is not born in December and not right. the twenty fifth. And you're honoring somebody on December 25th. I, I didn't want to. I didn't want to really go into that, but I, I will real quick here because uh, you're gonna get there. We know everybody knows that Jesus wasn't born on December 25th. So why do you it's, celebrate it's, Christmas? It, it, it's the day is symbolic of Jesus being reborn. So what scripture? What scripture do we have that said we, we we can have a symbolic day of Messiah being born? No, no, it's not about him being reborn. We're celebrating the Messiah. But, that but, we but, have but, one. So the scriptures is supposed to be our our uh, authority, correct? It is. So what what scripture do you have to give you authority to have a symbolic day for Jesus? Uh, which scripture says you can't? You, sorry, say that again. Which scripture says you can't? Um, which scripture says you not, can't? That you can't. In the way you can't, the you can't worship. You um, can't worship. Maybe not by oppression. Like right. there's just a few. Um, don't right. go after the gods of the people around you, the Shema. There's there, there's many scriptures that tell us not to go after the people. If we are in a if we are a set apart people, and the Most High He stamped us. Um, Deuteronomy seventy six, uh, Deuteronomy fourteen and I think five. I'm hundred percent sure. I ran across it last night. Fourteen and two. I think the it's con, con, fourteen and two. If He says that we are all you know, set apart people unto Him, um, above all nations, that means out of everyone He created on this earth. We are set apart. Mm -hmm. We are to live a specific life, and because we chose idolatry, and actually, in actuality, I meant the word I meant to use was paganism. But mm -hmm. um, you know, paganism and, and idolatry can is is hand to hand. Um, right. Can be hand to hand. Um, yeah, it, it depends yeah, on the context. Yeah, definitely, yeah. Yeah, um, paganism, yeah. paganism is to have a, a god that's not the god of the Hebrews. Yeah. So you know, we just went over history that says the only begotten Son. And to us, we don't like to use the, I, I don't want to get into semantics uh, because God is a pagan term. So to us, he, we're all gods. We're all Allah We have one most high and Yeshua or the Messiah is not the most high. He's not equal to most high, but I don't want to get into that. Let, let's stay on the topic of 25 days of idolatry. So we, we, we have clear cut historical information that you're following a fable if you follow Christmas, because Messiah was it was not born in a cold in a cold period. So if you if you're celebrating Messiah, no matter what you call him, if you're celebrating him December twenty fifth, you're caught up in fables. Now now let's move on because the night is getting long. Yeah. Let's address let's address the tree. How, how do how do you well, how I, do you reconcile the, 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 the tree? I'm sorry. Uh, can I, can I, just, I wanted to finish those two script, other two scriptures and I was just gonna just bounce off. Yeah, yeah. Which which ones you want to go to? Colossians 2 16. Colossians 2 16. Colossians 2 16. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or any drink or respect of any holy day or on the new moon or the Sabbath days. And again, uh, I know you're not I know you're not prepared. I, I know you don't you didn't have a, a, a chance to, to know this or research this. He's he's this is a, a blatant contradiction. You see, I italicized again, but this is a blatant contradiction when he says let no man judge you, but we're going to judge the Malachium. That's a, that's a direct contradiction. Regardless of, of how you try to try to slice it up, judging, if we're judging in, on anything, if, if we have the authority, because we're the children of Israel, to judge the Malachium, and I can't judge you about what you're eating or drinking, that's a contradiction. And another point, I, I, I don't want to give you the sources yet, 
because I, I gotta I gotta build everything together. But I am gonna I do share the sources in the class, but this right here is another clear indicator that the pagans have tainted Paul's letters. Letters. Because if this is true, what he's saying, if Paul really believes this, then his life was a contradict contradiction because he always taught on the Sabbath days. So he's being a hypocrite, like like Hamashiach told the Pharisees. So that's, but that's, not what that, that's not what that means. What he's saying, even even he said, if I keep it, don't judge me regardless. He, so not you shouldn't be he shouldn't be judged. What? Um, I, I gotta interject. Are you understanding um, what I'm saying? Hold on, sure. on. Let, let's be disciplined. Let, let's get him. Let, let, let him get his thoughts out. No, I, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't understand what you were trying to say. It, all right, I'm, I'm gonna read it out. Just to, let no man therefore judge you in, in in drink or respect of a holy day, or what we would call holiday, or the new moon, or the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. So whichever way you choose to go there, going back from the principle of what he just said there, you know what I mean? One person may do one thing, the other one, he's, what, what he's saying is this congruent thought between both verses is judge, don't judge, leave them alone and you mind your own business. Again, uh, I mean, I, I don't want to keep giving you, giving you the, without you reading it, the, okay, the, the editors. I understand that, fair, fair <laughs> enough. Can the, I can I then, just say two things real quick? So long. Yeah, uh, hold on. Um, Alex, have, let, we, let me hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Alex, let's let's have some discipline. We got a clear contradiction. Paul is a contradicting the prophets who spoke for Yah. That's one. B. You have to learn the men who who butchered his letters and taught this this doctrine. The church fathers that you learned, they they are the ones saying we don't want nothing to do do with Jewish uh, mm. Jewish days. We don't know we don't know we don't want anything to do with anything regarding the sabbath that's what you that's what you don't understand and I, and I have to be fair to you and give you time to research those things but we got to clear and, and obedo I'm, I'm about to uh, let you come on but let's just let's just go straight to the messiah let's just just because because paul says follow me as i follow as i follow christ right so let's just right. stick, stick with christ and let, he's saying, don't judge no man on, on meat or drink, right? Let's go straight to Christ. Let's go to Hamashiach. Straight to Hamashiach. And we're just going to stick with Hamashiach. So this, and we, we all know, we all learned men here. We know that this is Hamashiach speaking. And this is Revelations 2 and 14. This is a Mashiach, but I have a few things against thee because thou has though them, thou has there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel or Yahshua Allah, to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. So as us, we are the prophets, we're the son of the prophets, and we are now the ambassadors of Hamashiach. If a Mashiach is telling us that he don't want his brothers and sisters, the 12 tribes, eating things sacrificed to idols, if I if I remind you with love that you can't eat swine, that's not judging you. That's being a soldier for the Messiah. So again, you're you're holding to these these New Testament writings that's been greatly butchered and altered. And if it contradicts the prophets, it is it's it's in, it's invalid. So um before you go, uh, Benham, you had something to Benham? You might have muted his mic or something. Unmute yourself, brother. Ah, you still there, Ah? This yeah, Colin, I'm sitting on my phone froze. Right okay. here. Yeah, oh. here. Um, I wanted to um, try to like express two points. Um, and, and as um, Brother Elder Badiah, um said, you know, go back and read the um, scripture in context. For one, we have to realize that when Paul wrote this letter, he wrote it to um, Colossians, right? That's what the book you just read. Yeah, Colossians. Yes, he wrote it to the to, to Colossians, like not saying it, it, it like of course, but um, you know, for edification's sake, it does, you know, um, you know, apply it to us. 
but the, he was writing to them because of what was going on during that time during amongst them. Um, that's that's one. Um, secondly, um, there's um, many scriptures where the Most High uh, t- tells the judge the righteous judgment. Even in um, in in the, we have a whole book called Judges. Yeah. Um, even in the, in the Torah in, in Deuteronomy, it, it tells us how to it shows us how to judge righteously. That's why we uh, um, a matter is, is, is established in the mouth of two or three witnesses because I can say, hey, you stole my my ox, and I go. I have two people that knew I had the oxes, and, and you know, and they vanished forever. So I, I brought my witnesses. Not necessarily to say that they seen you steal it. However, you have your two witnesses that stay here. I wasn't even no way. I was in a whole different um state. I was in a whole different um sovereign. I was in a whole different country. So now, it. I don't understand what you're saying about the policing thing. We are supposed to amongst each other. Um handle disputes and if we can't handle dispute that's when we go before the elders and we go before the judges and they as a community according to torah um set in a judgment you know there's a difference between judging and judgment and final judgment um right. also um like i said in in, in um in um in context of, of, of his writing to colossians when he was talking about um, not eating meats and, and judging others. It wasn't even so much about the eating meat part. It was about, you had to remember like what we're celebrating now, the Feast of Dedication. There was times when our brothers and sisters were persecuted, like physically put to death for keeping the commandments, for saying that they were Israel. You know what I'm saying? So they had to go in hiding in order to preserve their lives. You know, if everyone would say, you know, would have stood up and say, hey, you know, I'm going to proclaim, the, um, you know, the ways and laws of the Most High, who's to say whom would actually be here today, um, and um, or or how the Most High would have intervened? Remember that we were actually in captivity because we we let other rulers, you know, um, dictate to us uh, what we what we know we should have been um, keeping. And with that being said, he was saying to the you got to remember two things. Paul was a Pharisee. Paul wasn't the only Pharisee. He was a high esteemed Pharisee, which means he knew the letter of the law. He wasn't talking to babes in Christ, so to say, or, or, or babes in the Torah, those who were, who, who had no um, knowledge or had no any um, understanding of the Torah. He was talking to people, to scholars. So on the surface, to someone else, it might seem as though he's going off. In actuality, everything he's saying, he's, he's referring back to the, um, to, um, to, um, to, to the Torah. For instance, when he said, live, live peace to be with all men, he was, he was quoting Jeremiah, Jeremiah 29. When, wow. when, when Mosai said, I go send you to, into captivity, live peacefully among them. And, and I, we had a question, I had to actually, not to go off subject a little bit, but I, it was a comment during the voting season about voting, or whatever. And, you know, um, the person was like, oh, you know, they was trying to, um, I was saying that the Mosai said, don't set no king above you. He gonna, he's going to set the king amongst, you, amongst your brethren. Then how, how, is, how, how is voting lawful? That he's like the person through the scripture that uh, live peaceably with all, I mean, with all men. Living peaceably with all men does not mean acting or doing the sins that they do. I can live peacefully among you without. I don't have to vote. I don't have to put no king above me. I'm living. I'm not rocking the boat. I'm not causing the uh, issue. I'm not saying you know, you know the Most High. He chose him as a king. He's gonna raise him up. Let's up, you know, let's up, uproot this um this, this uh, person in, in, in authority. No, like we no, we live in peacefully because we wait, we're waiting for Mashiach to come back to, to deliver us to take us up out of this land. Come, but come. It, when he was talking about um in meat and drinking, he was he was talking to the Israelites who were practicing, who had the chance to still practice. He would say, hey, don't look down on your other brothers who, who went through persecution and they couldn't um keep the law, keep the feast days. That's what he meant by that. He, he, so, was, he was he was he was basically showing them another way to have compassion. Like have compassion on 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 the, on the brothers and sisters that that might not have been able to keep the fizes, um, you know, because they were literally getting put to death. And and to to bring it back in, every everything with, with the Most High and the Messiah is is righteousness. Like again, the the letters to these uh, Israelites, the Colossians, the the Ephesians, these are all Israelites who've been raised in Greek captivity. And they're not rooted in the Torah, so they're they're getting everything the best they can. So that's a great point um, of Benham brought out. Thank you for that. Uh, to, to to get to a conclusion, our end game here is to prepare for the Exodus and to prepare for salvation. Do you think it's possible to have to to, to win salvation if we're practicing pagan customs? Can can we can we win salvation? By following the, the the heathen customs, 
No, no, you, you don't want to do that. So, so we have a clear answer from you and, and you are a leader of a, of a clergy that we have to abandon Christmas, right or wrong? No, that's not what I said. Well, you just double talk because you says well, we just we just we just verified that Christmas is a heathen custom, and you says no, and you no, said no, yeah, we should I, abandon well, that, heathen that, customs. Well, that's where that's that that's that's where the point of contention is is and and that that, that brings me to my last scripture that I, w- I was going to show you. It actually is a Hebrew scripture, uh, which is spoken by uh, David. Um, we, we, let's, we, let's return there and then so just so uh, um, there's, like a, there's a scripture where we can practice he hold on before we go there because i want to make sure we get the con there's a scripture in the hebrew scrolls that we can we can follow after the heathens because we just went no, through no, no we just no, went through history right that christmas right, right. is pagan it, it comes from every the, the christmas sweater the yule log the christmas tree they, they they said one nation had a a, a fir, the romans had a fir tree the egyptians had the palm tree it, it, what, 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 what book did you get that from? You, those, I, those are people that white men wrote that. Okay, so what about Jeremiah ten and five? White man wrote Jeremiah ten and five. No, I explained that, and you saw my video where I explained that. It no, took, it no, took a half an hour. I don't have a half an hour to, to explain to you what Jeremiah ten and twenty five is about again. You said Jeremiah ten and twenty five, and I'm, I'm I'm going from memory here. Uh, you said Jeremiah ten and five can't be about the Christmas tree because right, Christ wasn't right. born. That that's 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 the statement you're going to tell the Messiah when he comes. That's what you're going with. This can't. Yeah, this tree wasn't about, about you. That was this, not. That was that totally was not about Christ. It had nothing to do with Christ. That was so, about a pag, uh, That was about a pagan god. Okay, so where where can we find in the scrolls any any Israelites practicing a custom ordained by Yah that we can cut a tree down and bring a tree in our house. Can we can we go to the scripture in the book yes. of Psalms? Let's go to let's go to where are we going. I, like I said, I'd rather the scripture talk than me. What what, what are we going to? Oh, Psalms, Psalms twenty four. Psalms twenty four, and this is going to say we can follow the heathens. Let let it talk for itself. I don't want to speak for it. Uh, let's let the scripture speak for itself. So Psalms 24 going to tell us we can follow the heathens, y'all. Psalms 24 and how far we read the whole thing? No, no, you can just start with the first one. Start on the first one. Just leave, Psalms, you can, yeah. Psalms 24 and one. The uh, Arataza is the most highs and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell in there. Keep going. What, what was that? What, what was that word you used in the beginning? The earth is the most highs. Okay, yeah, all right, okay. The earth is the most highs, and the fullness thereof. I know the Hebrew Hebrew word for earth was erect, so I thought you said something different. Okay, that's but, that's Yiddish. That's that's the that's the Khazars. That's that's Polish. There is no E's in Hebrew. There is no Z's in Hebrew. So huh. the, the earth is the the earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof. The world and they that dwell therein. There. So this gives us permission to follow the heathens. No, the point is the heathen don't own anything. See, sometimes we give them too much credit. Devil don't own none of this stuff. This ain't his. The earth is the Lord's. <laughs> so what, what you doing? Stuff. What, that that what you, tree was not the devil's tree. He don't own that. That's the, the, God's um, tree. <laughs> Hasatan didn't own the kingdom, but he took Messiah up on a on a high um, on the on a pinnacle and, and showed him saying, "You bow and worship me. This all be to you." So ah, you're exactly right. I, I love that you said that because that's that's the whole point of that scripture. That the irony was he trying to offer uh, the Messiah something that belongs to him. Hold on, uh, hold, hold on. Let, let's because we we got some he people. To the he, said, he said, "Call no man good, but but, but the Father." Hold, hold on. Let, let, let's let's ring this in because we got people on Facebook. We got babes on here. I'm sorry. Okay, I didn't I didn't know. I thought it was all just a, a learned group here. No, and we got well, you know, we you got, got other people get for work too. So right. Um, so you're gonna leave off with the fact that the Most High owns everything. We can we can take even though the heathens are taking something and making it. I can concede your point if the Christmas tree started with us and they took it and mocked it. 
the Christmas tree or any cut, you have no record of any righteous man that followed the Messiah ever doing anything with a tree. So let me let me lay, drop this in your spirit and you meditate on it at work and come back if, if you can. Okay. We're, me and you are both married men and we're assuming our wives are faithful women. If you found out that your wife was carrying prophylactics in her purse and, and you mm-hmm. called her on it and she says, oh, babe, I use those for such and such. I know what everyone else using them for, but I don't use them for that. Would you accept that? Are you going to be okay with that? Uh, I wouldn't believe that. Yes or true. no. Yes or no. Yes or no. Yeah. Yes. Or, let's be men here. Yes or no. That, would you that, be okay? No, so, okay, dear. Would, would, would you kiss her on the lips and say, okay, yes or no? Would you be okay? Would you accept that? No. Obviously. That, okay, no. You said no. Thank you. So, that's what you're asking the most high to do. You're saying, I know the pagans use this for this, but I'm not doing it like them. So, it's okay for me to offer you something. That the, that the pagans do because it's your tree it's your tree and even though the pagans do all kind of wickedness to it i'm not doing it where where did the custom start from who are the first people to cut trees down according to our according to our scrolls who who are the first people recorded to cut trees down and decorate them the canaanites I don't know. I can't go that far i don't know the canaanites the canaanites so what you just did, and I appreciate you coming on and, and inputting, because that's what we need. We, we need dialogue. We need, we need civil men with learning to come on. So we appreciate your time. I know you got to go to work. But what you just did in our community, we call that adding philosophy to the book. You're, you're, you're doing A plus B equals C. So D, if D equals B, then D must equal C too. That's all Greek logic and philosophy. You're saying, even though the... the even though the, the heathens are, are cutting this tree down and they used to worship the tree, well, I'm gonna cut I'm gonna cut the tree down and I'm just gonna decorate my house with it. It doesn't matter, Op. It's still filthy to the most high. If if if, if Yeshua comes tonight and you have anything pagan in your house, a tree, a cross, anything, you're gonna be held accountable because you've been seeing this, you've been hearing this. And Isaiah Did you just say cross. I'm sorry. I thought, I thought I heard you say across. Cross, C R O S S, across. That that's the, that's a pagan entity. That's not that has nothing to do with any Messiah. That has nothing to do with any. That has nothing to do with salvation. That is a. If you do the research, I, I ain't gonna overwhelm you tonight. I, I'm, I'm glad you came on. I, I don't want to overwhelm you, but when you do the research, that that's that's a T. That's a cross for Tammuz. That's not that's not for Messiah. He didn't he didn't conquer the cross. Uh, Nero Nero. He crucified 3,000 Israelites on a cross in one day. So uh, I appreciate you coming on and, and just, you know, continue to do your research and do the best you can. Meditate, because I, I see what you're saying and, and I, I see your point. And, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but to, to sum up what you're saying is, although the pagans use the tree as a god, you're not using it that way. You're going to take it and make it something holy. And that's why we got to end with Isaiah five and 20. Woe to those who call good evil and evil good. So when you call the tree good because you done washed it up, Isaiah said, the Most High says, whoa, you can't do that. And then your 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 points that you use with the New Testament, they're they're really, I mean, they're they're a good effort. I appreciate the effort. But and I know you don't I know you don't you haven't had a chance to to study those those editors, but Paul's letters have been Messiah himself sounds like a contradiction when you when you stand on their um, when you stand on their edits. Messiah himself sounds like a schizophrenic. You know, I come to save the world, but go not to the Gentiles. So um, I, I appreciate you coming on. I, I, I pray over you and your, your family, and I bid you a good night, a, a great shift tonight. And please, you know, if you got free time, you, you're more than welcome to come back on. We say shalom to you. Shalom to you. Khan, God, God bless you. Hallelujah, all praises. So, uh, Abel, did you have any more uh, questions or comments or concerns before we uh, wrap? It's about nine. It's 10 after nine. And I had I had more websites bookmarked um, to show the people, but 
as I was thinking about it, yeah. it's like everything is redundant because we went yeah. over the the yeah. the, uh, the, the, the Yule the Yule log, the the uh, Christmas sweater, the eggnog, the Christmas caroling, family. Those on 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 Facebook, those who are going to watch this at a later date, you can Google each one of these customs that the world is doing right now, and they all tie back to pagan Babylon. Even even th that song "Joy to the World." Let, let's let's end with that. Uh, then I'll, uh, I'll let you have some. So they're gonna be singing "Joy to the World." The Lord has come. So let's see if the Messiah agrees with "Joy to the World," because in our culture, we, we use the book. We don't use Greek philosophy. We don't use the, the doctrine of men. We use what the Most High has given to the prophets. We use the Messiah. And when it comes to the, the letters of the elders, we got to be Bereans and, 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 and excrete all the, the junk that these pagans have inserted into the apostles' writings. So joy to the world, right? Let me see if the world got joy to coming to them. This is Matthew 10 and verse 34. Matthew 10 and 34. This is Hamashiach, because y'all know the tradition. The pagans put it in red, and they say when it's in red, it's the Messiah talking. Matthew 10, 34. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. So if you're out there singing joy to the world, and you're shopping cart full of gifts and a trunk full of gifts, and you're singing joy to the world, you're following a pagan idol, a pagan Messiah, and if you don't repent before Yeshua comes, you will have hell to pay. Oh, Benham, you have something before we wrap? I mean, yeah, it's, uh, you know, I just, I just, you know, pray that, uh, you know, the scales are removed from our brother's eyes because, I mean, at, at one point in time, you know, I was um, diehard into Christianity until I realized there is a difference between <clears throat> the law, statute, commandments, and the instructions of the Most High and religion. And, and once until a person separates that in, in, in traditionalism and, and, and things of that nature, uh, keeping the feast day, yes, it's tradition. However, it is a right trad tradition. Um, it is um, a commandment tradition because, uh, you know, we are, we are to keep the Passover, you know, um, <clears throat> feast on leavened bread, um, you know, um, different um, feast day at the most high, he, uh, you know, he um, set, um, set forth for us. So like, even though I will say Leviticus uh, 19, 18, um, 23, there are different examples of scriptures that um for the most high, you know, he they, he gave instructions. Um, you know, even some of our Exodus, you know, um, they're they're repeated in different um aspects of the book because he wants to make sure that we don't forget, you know, even says in Deuteronomy 6 chapter, you know, don't forget, you know, let's not forget, you know, when you're hungry and, and, and when you're eating in full, let's not forget the most high, you know, the Elohim. Um so so we have to you know realize that those things are um you know, are, are it, not saying it's a slippery slope, but it depends on the person's level of understanding, you know, because I, I, I mean, I'm listening to the brother and I, I, I just can't see it because you can say, okay, you know, stay, it, it don't say where not to, but it does. Because if, if you're not supposed to go after the ways of, of a heathen or the people that are around about you, you're not supposed to, um, if you're not our oppressor, choose none of his ways. Who has oppressed us? There's people that wrote these, that made these holidays up and, and things of that nature. So if, if that be the case, why are we going after their ways? Um, I do have another point. Maybe I'll, I'll bring it up a different day. John 14, um, um, something that was brought to my um attention. Um, is it about Christmas? Yeah. Um, no, no, it's not about Christmas. It's, it's about um, it's just about, about the kingdom. But like I say, I, 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 you know, I'll, I'll maybe I'll text you or something, or we could, you know, dialogue about that another time. Uh, um, uh, the subject, but it's something that was brought to my um, you know, brought to my vision. Now it's, it's, it's amazing. I just, I definitely would love the answer for that. But, um, um, I just wrote it down, so I remind you doing Shabbat. But um, to to summarize the, the the dangers of what the world is doing right now, it's um to me it 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 all it all starts with identity. If you don't realize who you are, it's no big deal. Because to the heathen, it is no big deal, and they're not going to be charged with none of what they're doing. Because the Most High didn't tell the heathens not to eat swine. He didn't tell the heathens they couldn't worship their gods. As a matter of fact, it's just the opposite. And one of the prophets, I believe it's uh, Zechariah or, or, or Micah, he says that when he when he regathers us, that he, everyone's going to return to their rulers or their gods. 
and Israel is going to return to me. So not knowing who you are is, is got our people very lost. If you're an Israelite, you have no business following the ways of the other nation because you belong to the Most High Yah. So he don't have a problem with the Italians, the Russians celebrating a Christmas or, or bringing in a Christmas tree. Just to, even the word Christmas itself, um, I praise the Most High Yah for uh, Pastor Kelly um, Richardson. He brought out a couple years ago, and I fact check because that's what the Bereans do. The word Christmas is is Christ, Christ Mass. No, no, no Israelite, no Hebrew, no, no Messianic Nazarite ever had a mass service. That's Catholic. That's Roman Catholic. So having a mass for Christ, it actually means to do away with Christ. If you do the, the research, Christ Mass is a week where they do away with Christ and you do what you want. Sleep with boys, uh, the slaves, like, like we read, the slaves imitate being masters. So Christ Mass is doing away with Christ for, for a whole week of, of drunkenness, debauchery. And this is stuff people don't, it's not common knowledge. What we're teaching, what we're learning is not common knowledge, but for the love of our nation, we got to put it out there. And we got to challenge people, no matter what level you're on, whether you're just coming into this or whether you have a PhD, you have to do the research and you have to be able to look yourself in the face and you have to be able to be real with the Messiah. There's no way you could put a bow on a Christmas tree and not and not think that you're gonna not gonna be judged by the by the Messiah for that. Um also before it gets too late, I wanna I wanna endorse um I wanna endorse the um Septuagint again. I was going over a verse today and Abim, can you help me read here? I want you to read um I found this today and I was like oh my goodness and and family the Septuagint this right here you see on the screen is based on the Masoretic text. The Masoretes or Talmudists, the wicked rabbis who killed Messiah, they didn't believe in Messiah. So anything they wrote and translated is already wicked, is, is wrote in the spirit of wickedness. But we see based on the Septuagint, they have taken verses out. They have changed verses. They have added to verses. So they wrote Torah law. And we can we we see their their um, edits all over when we get to Septuagint. So a bit of if you can, can you read um, Isaiah twenty seven in the Masoretic version? And I'm going to read it in the uh, Septuagint. We're going to pick it up um, Isaiah, Isaiah twenty seven and let's pick it up at um, let me see. Let's pick it up uh, verse six. Know what? Pick it up at at, at uh, verse three, Isaiah twenty seven and three. We're going to go on down. The book of Isaiah, chapter twenty seven, verse three. I, the Lord, do keep it. I will water it every moment, lest any hurt it. I will keep it night and day. Fury is not of fear, so like you. fury is not in me. Who was set? The, the briars and the thorns against me in battle. I will go through them. I will bum, so I, can, I will burn them together. Or let him take hold of my strength that he may make peace with me and he shall make peace with me. And he, so I get so verse six, he shall cause them that come up that so I get, he shall cause them that come of Jacob to take root. Israel shall blossom and bud and fill the face of the world with fruit. Verse seven, hath he smitten him or have he smote those that smote him or has he slain according to the slaughter of them that are slain by him? Verse eight, in measure, when it, when it showeth forth Thou will debate with it. He slayeth his rough wind in the day of the um, east wind. Verse 9. Verse 9. By this, therefore, shall the iniquity of Jacob be purged, and this all by the fruit to take away his, his sin. When he maketh all the stones of the altar, chalk stones that are beaten in sunder, the gloves and images shall not stand up. 
Now watch how much better it reads and directly it reads in the uh, Septuagint. I'm going to pull up the online Septuagint and we're going to read it in the Septuagint. And I'm just going to show you why I'm I'm pushing everyone to start checking uh, the prophets or the Old Testament out in the Septuagint and throw the Masoretic text in the garbage. And this copy is based on the one I have um, by LCL Britain. There's another one online uh, on Amazon. It has the uh, just the modern English that's easier to read. But this is the one I bought. And um, both both of the ones, uh, I think the one that's with the modern English is by Lexiham, the Lexiham edition. And they line up uh, perfectly. But let me read this to you in the Septuagint. And then I'll go back to the Masoretic and show you how badly they butchered this uh this prophecy or redemption for us um isaiah 27 in the septuagint and when you hear it in the septuagint you're going to barack the most high even more salvation is first and foremost for the original uh tribes of israel we will be uh resurrected and restored and the the, the strangers who who obey the messiah they are last, but watch how Isaiah really recorded this uh, based on the Septuagint. So this is Isaiah 27, and I'm gonna pick it up at verse three. I apologize for the strong, uh, small font. Verse three, Isaiah 27 and three in the Septuagint. I am a strong city, a city in a siege. In vain shall I water it. It shall not, it, Salaki, it shall be taken by night and by day the water shall fail, fall. There is no woman that has taken hold of it. Who will set me to watch stubble in the field? Because of this, because of this enemy, I have set her aside. Therefore, on this account, the Lord has done all, all that he appointed. Verse five, I am burnt up. They that dwell in her shall cry, let us make peace with him. Let us make peace. They that are coming are the children of Jacob. Israel shall bud and blossom. Let me pause and break this down, what the prophet is saying, what the Most High is saying. The Most High is saying he's going to destroy and burn up the city. So verse 5, he says, this is the city crying out. Verse 5, I am burnt up. They that dwell in her shall cry, let us make peace with him. Let us make peace. So the the wicked fake Khazars and everyone else that's in our land, when the most high wreak havoc on the land and start to purge the land, they're gonna know why they're being rained down on, and they're gonna say, cry out, let us make peace with God. Let us make peace with the most high. Why do they want to make peace with the most high? Verse six. They that are coming are the children of Jacob. Israel shall bud and blossom, and the world shall be filled with his fruit. Anyone teaching replacement theology don't understand the Bible. They have a spirit of Satan on them. The 12 tribes of Jacob will never be replaced, has not be replaced. But more importantly, I want, I want the family, especially those who have already moved over to the land and they're calling people back to the land, come on over to the land. The most high is not done with the land. The most high is going to scorch the land of Yashar Allah and get it ready for us. He's not going to make it bloom and blossom while those pagans are still there with their idol worship and their fornication. He just said here, let me finish this up. This is Isaiah 27 verse five. I am burnt up. They that dwell in her shall cry. Let us make peace with him. Let us make peace. They that are coming are the children of Yaakov. Yasha Allah shall bud and blossom, and the world shall be filled with his fruit. Verse 7. Shall he himself be thus smitten, even as he smote? And as he slew, shall he be thus slain? Fighting and reproaching, he will dismiss them. Does thou not meditate with a harsh spirit to slay them with a wrathful spirit? Verse 9. Therefore shall the iniquity of Yaakov be taken away, and this is his blessing, when I shall have taken away his sins, when they shall have broken to pieces all the stones of the altars 
as fine dust. So the Most High is promising that all the wicked people inside our land right now and our inheritance, I'm going to scorch the land and burn it up. And they're going to they're going to plead the Most High and says. Let me mute. Uh, so the Most High is promising to us. He's going to burn the land up and the people that's there, they're going to be pleading like, let us make peace with the Most High because the children of Jacob are coming. All praise be to the Most High. Now let's go back and get it in the Masoretic so you can see once again how piss poor, uh, excuse my language, the Masoretic text chopped up our scrolls. So let's go back to Isaiah 27 in the Masoretic. And it says, I, the Lord, do keep it. I will water it every moment, least any hurt it. I will keep it night and day. Fury is not in me. Who will, who will set the briars and thorns against me in battle? I will go through them. I will burn them together. Or let him take hold of my strength that he may make peace with me. And he shall make peace with me. He shall cause them that come of Jacob to take root. You see how badly butchered that it is? He shall cause them that come of Jacob to take root. The heathen is going to cry out, verse 6. They that are coming are the children of Jacob. So family, that's why I'm begging all of you, each and every one of you, to forsake the Masoretic text. Those priests were wicked. They are, they are the sons of the um, rabbis who killed Messiah. So they have a wicked spirit on them. They have edited, butchered the Masoretic text. That's why many people, uh, classes and breakdowns are a little off, not not because they're being uh, intentionally deceitful. Many people don't know how badly the Masoretic text has been butchered. So if you're out there, you want to be a, a, a student, a, a Berean, if you're a teacher, I, I, I please, I, I beg you, I implore you, please get the Septuagint and start comparing the prophecies and the promises based on the Septuagint because it reads more true to what the Most High spoke. And with that, uh, I'll yield before we pray out. A bit of you have anything else. Doc, are you still on? Did you want to make a, a final comment? Uh, I don't know if you're still there. It seems like you're still logged on. Yeah, I'm driving in the car uh, right now. Uh, I just thank you guys for your time. Uh, and like I said, I appreciate being around people that, you know what I mean, are searching for the truth. Uh, at the end of the day, that's what we're all doing. All praise, all praise to the Most High Yah through the blood of the Messiah. Hallelujah, Hallelujah. Abinam, you have a final comment? Um, yeah, Khan. Um, I just um, well, actually, Isaiah um twenty seven is five. What's the verses that we just read? We read Isaiah twenty seven. Four, four, four uh, ten. Khan, is it four through ten? Uh, we read three to through ten. Three to oh, uh, Khan, three. yeah, yeah, Sorry, Khan. yeah so you and could also if you could um. I I would like scriptures that can I uh, you said that uh, we um we um what's the word um in, in, in holy convocation you know we keep the you know the first day and the last day of of of, of dedication as a shabbat uh -huh. um, I I want maybe possible something tangible in writing a scripture or because I mean I can argue the fact that every feast day that we held outside of one day has been held with a, a Shabbat in the beginning, Shabbat at the end of the day, like as in tradition, like we know that Feast of Dedication wasn't um, given to us in the Torah. We know that that was, you know, um, throughout our, our history, you know, throughout, our, throughout excuse me, throughout, um, so I can throughout our different captivities, but I, I'm having a dialogue with somebody and, you know, so I want to try to pull up, a, a, you know, as many scriptures as I can, you know, about that, um, you know, um, being a, um, a, you know, a holy convocation um, or, you know, or, or, the, um, um, the the problem people are having op is when they read the word uh, Shabbat, every everyone and we brought this out with the uh, we brought this out with the divine rhythm class. People are equating Shabbat with with rest, and they they're creating Shabbat every time they see the word Shabbat, they're thinking of the weekly uh, Shabbat, and the word Shabbat is based on the Hebrew word Shabbat, and Shabbat in most contexts. Shabbat or Shabbat is relating to seven, meaning, you know, the seven day Sabbath. But every once in a while, when an elder, depending on that generation, because 
people think these elders sat down and just wrote everything out. Isaiah prophecy spans years. So a prophet or a scribe would sit down and he wouldn't, he wouldn't, everything we're reading, he wouldn't write that all in one setting. As, as Yah spoke to him that day, he would record it maybe. And then he would stop and put it up. So people think every time they see Shabbat, that is referring to the weekly Sabbath. But we brought out in that class, the divine Sabbath rhythm. The weekly Sabbath is based on a word Shabbat. Shabbat is based on seven, but it also means oath. It also means oath. So sometimes when the elders use that word Sabbath or Shabbat, they're not alluding to the weekly Sabbath. They're, they're telling the people, remember this covenant that we're making. Remember this oath that we're making that every year we're going to gather on this day to commemorate what the Most High has did, did, done for us. So that's what got people getting hung up. Every time they read the word Sabbath or Shabbat, they're thinking it's talking about the weekly Shabbat. The only really precept that I can give you is when it's first instituted in Maccabees. Um, and that's when he says, you know, let us commemorate this. Let me switch to the standard. I think is Maccabees 4 or 5. Um, and that's that's this, this is the only time I, I find that it was um, the elders gave specifics of when we was going to do it. They saw the sanctuary desolate. So this is when they're cleaning up the sanctuary. So this is first Maccabees chapter four. Oh, here it is. So this is first Maccabees chapter four, verse 52. And um, they already cleaned up the, um, well, let me go back up to, to get the context. This is first Maccabees four and 48. And made up the sanctuary and the things that were in, that were with, within the temple and hollowed the courts. They made also new holy vessels and into the temple they brought the candlestick and the altar of burnt offerings and of incense and the table. And upon the altar they burnt incense and the lamps that were upon the candlestick they lighted that they may, might give light into the, in the temple. Verse 51, furthermore, they set the loaves upon the table and spread out the veils and finished all the works which they had begun to make. Now on the five and twentieth day of the ninth month, which is the month of Kaslu, in the hundred and forty eighth year, they rose up betimes or early times in the morning, and offered sacrifice according to the Torah upon the new altar of burnt offerings which they had made. Look at what time and what day the heathen, oh I'm sorry, look at what time and what day the heathen had profaned it. So they saying, look at, look at the most high on the very same day that the heathens came and put the swine in our temple, all praise be to Yah, we cleansed it that same day. It was the 25th day of the ninth month. So that's what they're marking here. And it says, even, even in that it was dedicated with songs and cithurns and harps and cymbals, then all the people fell upon their faces, worshiping and praising Yah of heaven, Shemayim, and who had given them good success. And so they kept the dedication of the altar eight days and offered burnt offerings with gladness and sacrificed the sacrifice of deliverance and praise. So that's why some of our brothers and sisters are going into it tonight. We're, we're just on our 10th month. We, uh, we follow a different uh, schedule. We're 30 days ahead of them. But we don't, we don't, you know, you know, the tour group, we ain't making no hissy fit. We, we praise the most high for everybody who's celebrating the feast days. So um, it starts on the 25th of the ninth month and it goes for eight days. And then this is when Judas, he says, verse 59. Moreover, Judas and his brethren with the whole congregation of Yahshua Allah ordained that the days of the dedication of the altar should be kept in their season from year to year by the space of eight days, from the five and 20th day of the month of Kaslu with myrrh and gladness. So this is the, this is the only uh, black and white explicit directions of the feast. And based on the way we do things at the Torah group, our Shabbats always fall, the weekly Shabbats, meaning seven, they always fall uh, eight, 15, 22, and 29. So the 25th day of the month, for us is the third day after Shabbat. 
So again, some of these people, they just don't understand what, what Sabbath mean or the context is being used. So we come together on the 25th, we, we convocate, we celebrate um, the other seven days, maybe if the family was at home doing something special, but on the eighth day, we come together again and sell it and finish the feast finish the feast out so this is the only precept i really can give you i think is it mentioned i don't think it's mentioned in the next chapter your comment i don't know maybe i'm wording it wrong but i was just trying to you know how on um with the feast on 11 bread we know that first day is a, is a shabbat and that last day is shabbat like i'm just yeah. trying to see if that is an example as far as with um dedicated but the feast of dedication, and if not, no, I stand corrected. No sloppy, you know. But yeah, I thought, they, good because because I guess maybe how, and it's not one, you know, just one person. You know, there are few brothers that um, you know, that teach that um, you know, that we you know we we treat it as a, a Sabbath, you know, um, a day of rest as well. You know, now had to um, feast of dedication for the first day, um, started on a weekly Shabbat, or you know, which we you know Friday Sunday and Saturday Sunday now um during the pagan week, or actually. No, because that that'll be longer. Um, yeah, on um on the week of Shabbat, then the week of Shabbat overrides. Like you still you can you observe, but I guess you double prepare. Cause like I was under the impression that if um a feast day fell on the Shabbat as well, that the that that feast day let's say override the Shabbat, but like like maybe you were able to not say by itself, but you could cook. You know, um it was like um. Um, I, 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 I'm, under, I'm not 100 sure. I want to. I got to probably go back at, over the the teaching I heard or the teachings. Um, I'm not 100 sure they saying you can or can't um, cook. But I know um, you know as far as Bonnie selling and you know the other uh, things um, that are um, you know um, we're not supposed to do on Shabbat. Um, I know they they're saying like those you know definitely don't do. But I was I would want to know as far as you know the cooking or the kindling the fire um, you know um, aspect of. It. I have to um, re go with some notes and stuff and and and, and re. Um, but I, yeah, I just basically I want to know if, um, if like I say, maybe is my misunderstanding if that um, being considered a Shabbat is actually like a, a Sabbath, which meaning um, you know a day of rest as well as we would do our weekly Shabbat. That, like that's um, that, or, or or you know the beginning of feast days how um, in uh, excuse me um, feast on eleven bread how that first day and last day is actually a Shabbat like a like a, a weekly Shabbat. The uh, we don't have we don't have any ironclad uh, witnesses that they they outlaw working on the first or any days of this feast because this this is from what I found this is the first time it was uh, ordained and we know that Judas and them the Maccabees are Levites so they had authority to ordain this feast and they didn't give they didn't give um, specifics whether you were whether whether um, work was outlawed like in the in the torah we see where it says thou should not work we see that explicitly but with the feast of dedication we don't have that now uh based on the research and, and what we put out like you're saying we do have concrete evidence that the feast of um tabernacles and the feast of um unleavened bread it starts on a on a weekly shabbat the 15th is a weekly shabbat and it and it ends on the next Shabbat. So, but if the feast of dedication here, he's saying it starts on the twenty fifth of the ninth month. The twenty fifth, the way we do our our calendar, the twenty fifth is not a is not a weekly Shabbat. So again, I think people are getting the context of Sabbath uh, convoluted with rest. Sabbath don't even mean rest. Sabbath became. Sabbath became associated with rest because we're supposed to do no civil work, but we we're the the, uh, the priests they're doing work because they're preparing they're preparing the bread they're preparing the uh the sacrifices so the priests are working but they're not they're they're working for Yah so that's common sense they're not they're not doing civil work I mean they're not working their vineyards and their their fields. That's what the most high the most high don't work want us doing our civil work because remember we brought this out a couple months ago why can't you take a break for the most high sabbath when you got a feel that he gave you we took it from the heathen so everything is profit so you have no our elders had no excuse 
for being greedy and not not taking not closing down their shop on Shabbat. Yeah, Carl, even um when it comes to the the the, the instructions of harvesting and, and planting and reaping, it tells you to leave a certain amount of crop. It tell you not to gather on a certain amount of day. I believe every seven years, if I'm not mistaken, you're supposed to not gather. Like you're supposed to just right. let the field life life uh, dormant. Yeah, calm, calm, calm. So that's what people they again we gotta wrap this up, but a lot of these brothers and sisters that they they they're YouTube students and they, they they see something on YouTube or Facebook and, and they don't verify nothing as doctrine. The, the brother, he was so convincing and he was so authoritative and he was so, so sure of himself. So his lesson got to be sound doctrine and it's not. And, and that's just the facts of the case. Um, the work the most high don't want us working is work where you're trying to earn a profit. But if I see a homeless man, if if I want to treat my wife to something, we can do that. That's a good act. That's what he told them. Like, you know, who, why is it evil to, to do good on the Sabbath? And that's what these brothers keep with their man-made doctrines. They don't understand. So you, you're going to let your, oh, yeah, you're yeah, gonna yeah. Let your uh, child stay, stay in, in a soil diaper because you don't want to change the diaper on the Sabbath? Yeah. And um, what about heating the milk? You have to feed the child. Right, right. So um, you, you, you ain't gonna make formula because you, it's the Sabbath. Calm, you know? even 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 in Tobit, like there's, there's examples. It, it's right. just like most times, really, really, so much to me. Excuse, I know we gotta go, like because I know they have the argument of of no queens. Even though it was an example of the Most High taking a queendom from a person, I, I have it in my notes. But the most there was a queen of Israel because it said it. It's, it's I can't remember who who it was, but basically his son, her son took away her queenship, but I don't know if she transgressed or what happened, but they're yeah. saying that there are no examples. Even, like, you know, uh, Judith, uh, I mean, there's a few There's a few examples. So I'm like, even like, according to what you said before, just these um, philosophical doctrines and, and, and oh, man. <laughs> I, a, I, try not to, I try not to, to, to present it as a debate or to, to present it as chopping people. And, but I love hearing these these uh, erroneous teachings and doctrines because it helps us sharpen our sword. The, the the greatest queen that you can say that, that was over us was Queen Hadassah Esther. She was married to the to the uh, king of Persia, so she, she was a queen even though she was married to a, a a pagan king. He he still gave Hadassah or Esther. He gave Esther and her uncle Mordecai rulership of his kingdom. So Esther was the queen, and she, and her uncle Mordecai was pretty much, you know, running running us throughout all the Persian Empire. So the, again, these brothers, I give them a for effort. At least they they're trying to, to teach something, and they they could be doing a lot worse things. But again, it, you got to take your time and be Bereans. You can't be impressed by this brother and his delivery and how how forceful he's bringing in and. It, all that yelling and, and all that screaming and condescending to people, that don't mean you right because you keep condescending someone and, and trying to belittle someone. That's be a Berean and fact check, verify everything. And culture trumps everything. Once you learn the, the culture, everything makes more sense. If we're in our own land, yes, by all means, we have all means to set apart the most high Sabbath the way he intends. We can prepare our foods the day before. We can get up on Shabbat and just celebrate because we in our own land and we don't have to worry about nothing. Here in captivity, we work nine to fives. Me and my wife work like 40 plus, sometimes 60 hours a week. So we can't we can't live like we want to live. That's what, and the most high knows that. How do I know that? I, because Deuteronomy 30 says, when you return to me with all your heart. That, with all your heart, that's lob. When you return with all your heart, your intent, what's inside of you is leading you to me, and you're doing, I see your efforts. You're doing all you can to stay with me. So these brothers make make doctrines and, and make this thing bondage for people. I hear them on, their, on some of their songs and music. I quit my job and because I couldn't. Then you then you beg it for money on, on, on Facebook uh, posts and, and GoFundMe pages. It's nonsense. It's nonsense. It's nonsense. But we're going to wrap up. I appreciate you coming on and helping read. And we're going to yeah. end with a prayer. Say a prayer for the family. 
say a prayer for 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 doc griffin came on say a prayer for the rest of our family and friends because we're going to continue pushing this truth and, and it's it's a matter it's, this is a love mission yeah, this is yeah. a love mission and, and we are the prophets we are the sons and daughters of the prophets it's our job to put this truth out there and not beat people over the head with it we 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 plant this truth we posted the the, the articles we post the the um the memes and all whatever your platform is get this truth out there and let the most high do the work so we're going to close out with prayer say shalom to saturday right. heavenly father we come before your throne covered in the blood of our king the only begotten son father we thank you for grace and mercy today father we ask that you you be with us in all our ways father we ask that you send your Holy Malachi to the four corners and sit over our homes as we sleep, Father. Those still on the roads and traveling and working, Father, we ask that you look over them as well, Father. And we don't pray just for the 12 tribes of Israel. We pray for the strangers as well that's out there standing up for your people, letting the world know that we are the seed of Jacob and you're coming back to get us, Father. Father, we commit this study into your hands and we pray that this study falls on fruitful ground, Father. We pray that each and every brother and sister, regardless of their understanding, their position in life, that they heed to the words of the prophet, Father, and they come back to your holy Torah the best they can and forsake all idols and return their hearts minds body and soul to the only the only high yah the only king of the heaven and earth father and and come back to you and worship you in spirit and truth as you call for father father we send your holy angels to do their jobs throughout the four corners and we give all honor glory and praise to the only begotten son who is the line of judah father he is the lamb of yah coming back to redeem us from the four corners father we give your name praise all honor and glory is due and then be assured how shall we pray hallelujah hallelujah and with that, family, we say Shalom, Shalom out. Shalom.